Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. The Black Museum. Its affiliated stations present Escape. All of fantasy. In a sanctum mystery. Lights out. Murder. At midnight. The sealed book. Presents. Suspense. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness Retro Radio. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. And in between the stories, I bring you some of the best dark, creepy, and horrifying old-time radio shows from what I've collected over the years. If you're new here, welcome to the show! While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, sign up for my free newsletter, connect with me on social media, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the weird darkness. Look, baby, this is where we stay till tomorrow morning. Tomorrow morning, you see? What are you going to do with me? You're my lawyer, and I want you to keep your nose clean as much as you earn it. But you got to take charge while I'm out of town. How serious is this trouble? Eh, nothing really. In Glovestown, some of the numbers guys are dipping in the till, and the punk operating the gambling joints is out of line. I'm just going over there, and I'm going to get a couple of boys to rough up a couple of those. Now, I don't want to know what you're going to do. <laughs> nah, of course not, counselor. I'll spare you the details. You just keep your eyes on things till I get back. Oh, uh, while I'm gone, there's one little thing, Walter. Oh? Okay, Allie, come on in. Hi. Right. Did you tell him, Jim? No, wait. Jim, I thought we agreed I wouldn't have to see Allie again. Who do you think you are, you shyster mouth? Shut up, Allie. One more word out of him and I'll slap him around like I did before. I said shut up. Now, it's for you, Waller. Remember this. Allie's still my kid brother, see? And while I'm away, you take care of him. Anything he wants. Anything he needs, understand? I just hope you try to cross me up, Walter. I'd like a reason to slug you I again. I said shut up, Allie. Now, you got it straight, Waller. Now, you take care of the kid. Even if he kills somebody. <laughs> I'm in already. Yeah. You'll sit down. What's on your mind, Ellie? There's a cop named Ed Brannigan. I want you to get him transferred to the suburbs or something. Just like that, huh? Just like that. Why? To teach him a lesson, that's why. Just do it. That's all, Walter. Look, Allie. 
Your brother Jim's organization has a very nice, shall we say, working relationship with the police. They're sensitive about it. So we don't push them around any more than we have to. We leave them as much dignity as we can. Walter, I told you what to do when you do it. This cop, this Brannigan, brought me in on a drunken disorderly last night. He arrested you? You didn't call me? I didn't have to. The death sergeant knew who I was, and he fell all over himself apologizing. He didn't seem to be worrying about dignity. And don't you either, Walter. Slap it to that cop. You. <laughs> you don't dare say what you want to, do you, Walter? <laughs> Allie, Jim will be back in a few days. Why not wait till then? If he says all right... Then... I want that cop transferred, and I want it done now. Look here, Allie, I'm a lawyer. Nuts, you're a mouthpiece, a shyster, a crooked shyster. Cut that out. Make me. Are you enjoying this? Making you sweat? If it weren't for Jim... Sure, I know, if it weren't for Jim. You've got to sit there and hate my guts, but remind yourself every minute that I'm Jim's kid brother, and... Be respectful to me. What I remember is you stealing a car when you were barely in your teens. That's what you remember. Mm -hmm. That and a lot more of the same. Well, what I remember, Walter, is you got me off each time. You said, yes, sir, and you saluted. And you got me off, shyster. You little punk. That's what I was waiting to hear. That's all. <laughs> Now, get that cop transferred. You hear me? All right. All right, Alan. That's enough. Oh, and by the way, slip me a couple of hundred. I feel a big night coming on. Or can't you spare it? Two hundred? Sure. Sure, Alan. <laughs> Boy, I bet you'd love to see me hurt. But you never will. Because whatever happens... I'll always have you to get me out of any jam. Isn't that right, Counselor? Sure, Allie. <laughs> How about a scotch, Mike? Oh, hi, Allie. I didn't see you come in. I've been over by the door about five minutes. Oh? No, uh, uh, hold that scotch a minute, Mike. Huh? I've been over by the door and I've been studying. What do you think I was studying, Mike? Well, I, I couldn't say. I was studying little Miss Innocence there. All oh, that young girl? That's right. Pretty young stuff. Oh, yeah, I told her I couldn't serve her, Allie, but well, she wants to stay, so I give her lemonade. The little lady must want to be picked up. Yeah, some guys have tried, but I told them to leave her alone. Do you appreciate that? No. <laughs> she didn't really want lemonade, did she? No, nah, she wants to feel big, Allie. She wants to feel important. I've been what you call uh, protecting her. You've been what you call saving her for me, Mike. Uh, Allie, you know, she's pretty young. Uh, what did you say, Mike? Nothing. Just remember who owns this bar. Well, I didn't mean nothing, Allie. Sure you didn't. I'll take that scotch now, Mike. I'll take it over there beside the little lady. Oh, sure, Allie. And I think for the little lady, well, after a lemonade, a daiquiri. Nice and strong. Sure, Allie. Hello there, cutie pie. Oh. Hello. I got a surprise for you. Oh? I am a magician. Oh. Well, can you say anything but, oh? I don't know. All right, we'll find out. You see Mike, the bartender over there? Yes. Now, what would you think he's going to do? Oh, I don't know. Yes, I do. I can tell you. He's going to come over here and tell you to get away from me. Okay, that's what you say he'll do. Mm-hmm. That's because that's what he's been doing all night, right? Yes. Well, what I say he'll do, I say he'll come over here and put down a scotch for me, and for you he'll put down a daiquiri. Oh. And I'll say, that's all, Mike. The little lady and I want to be alone. And he'll say, sure. Oh. And he'll go down the other end of the bar. I don't believe it. Here are, Allie. Scotch and a daiquiri for the lady. Thanks, Mike. Now, cutie pie and I want to be alone. Oh, sure, Allie. Uh, just call when you need something, Allie. <laughs> well? How did 
did you do it? I'm a magician. No, I mean, really, how? Don't ask questions. I just figure if the little lady wants to see life, the little lady ought to be allowed to see life without some bartender lousing her up. Well, <laughs> thanks. You got a name? I'm Ann DeVillo. Anything you need fixed? I don't know what you mean. Oh. Oh, this drink tastes strong. It's good for you. What I mean is that I'm a magician. And if there's anything you need, or maybe a family needs, why, just say the word and I'll, uh, wave my magic wand. <laughs> well. Well, if you could fix it up for my pop to earn a bigger profit. What does your pop do? Well, he's got a little business. It's construction work. He takes subcontracts, if you know what that means. I know. From big contractors with buildings to put up or like that, and he does the plastering part. And what's the name of his outfit? DeVillo and Son. The Son part's my brother. DeVillo and Son. Mm -hmm. Need a subcontract on construction for plastering work. It's as good as fixed. Oh, you sound as if you meant it. You'll see. Now, uh, how's about some plastering work right this minute? Mike? Yeah? Yeah, Allie? Two more. You're going too fast, Allie. You go this fast? Wait till we get near the airport around this next curve. Then I'll show you some speed. I'm scared. Slow down, please. Ooh, the little lady says slow down. We'll slow down. Okay. You're a cute little trick, you know that? Where have you been all this time? Home. Mama wouldn't let you out? Oh, it's my father who wouldn't let me out. He's old-fashioned, my pop. Ah, uh, he'll get over it. What'd you do tonight, sneak out? Well, we had... We had a fight. He said he wouldn't let me go to the dance Saturday, so, so I... So you came out and found me. Well, baby, it's a good thing. Except it's getting late. Ah, uh, so what? Well, I'm afraid of what he'll say when I get home. You just tell him he's going to have all the subcontracts he can handle. That'll shut him up. Oh, you don't know my pop. <laughs> Watch. He'll be begging you to go out with me and stay all night so he can keep getting work. You make it sound as if... As if what, Kitty Pie? As if I was... selling myself. Well, don't you worry your head about it. You're going too fast again. Well, we got to get there fast. Where? The place I've got. Oh, please slow down. I slow down once, that's enough. Please. I can handle a car, kid. But I'm afraid. Watch. Watch me take this curve. Oh! <laughs> Look out, that man! Oh! Oh! You hit him. You hit him. You hit that man. Yeah, I know I are you kidding? We've got to go back and see if we can help him. Calm down. But Allie, that man, he may still be alive. Not a chance, kid. He went through the air like a dummy. You've got to stop anyway. Not Allie Glazer, no, sir. But what kind of a man are you? You... Allie. Huh? Take me home, please. No. Please. Maybe you haven't noticed, baby, but the right headlight's out. For all I know, there's blood or clothing or something on the front of the car. They can stop me on account of the headlight, and then I'm stashing this car out of sight. All right. Don't take me home. Just let me off here. Not on your life. Allie! Please. You're a witness, baby. You stay with me. What are you going to do? Hide. But you can't hide forever. I can hide till 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. I can dump this whole problem in Walter Wayland's lap. Walter? Wayland, he's a lawyer. Allie? Well, what? Let me out, Allie. I won't tell anybody. I won't say anything, I swear. I'll just go home and... Shut up. But you can't hold me a prisoner. Can I? That's just what I'm going to do, kid. Hold you prisoner. You get used to that idea and shut up about it. <laughs> Here we are, cutie pie. 
Okay, come on in. All right. Here's where we stay till 10 tomorrow morning. But what are you going to do to me? Keep you right here. You like it? A little apartment I have for when I got little ladies that want a part of their nose. You know, you could use a little makeup job yourself right now. I don't. There's nothing I want but just to get out of here. Look, you're starting to give me a pain. Now knock it off. You hit that man and left him lying there on the street. Okay, you asked for it. You want any more of that? Please. I said you want any more of that? No. Please, no. Because I don't mind giving it to you. You behave and I won't hit you. I'll behave, Allie. I'll behave. I think you better know what you're up against. Do you know who I am? All I know is Allie. What about my last name? You didn't tell me. Oh, yes. When you were speeding away from the accident, I asked you to stop, and you said... You said not Allie Glazer. Glazer? Big Jim Glazer's brother. Oh. My brother owns this town. I know. You don't know everything. Not yet. Let me spell it out for you. At 10 o'clock, we're going to see Walter Wayland. He handles all my brother's legal affairs. He handles the fixes, too. And this is going to be a fix. But how can you fix it? Don't ask me. Walter Whalen will take care of all the details. But if he's a lawyer, I mean... It's one thing to maybe fix things... Like political things, but... But killing a man... Hitting a man with a car and running away... That's enough. <laughs> From now on, I hit you not once, but five, ten, fifteen times for every time you say I was driving any car that hit a man tonight. You understand? Yes. So, was I driving any car that hit any man? No, Allie. Well, that's better. Uh, okay. Now, just to straighten you out, Walter Whalen will fix this because he has to fix it. Not just for money, but because that's what he's for. To fix things. You get that? All right. And I'm keeping you here, and later I'll take you to Walter's office because he may need you as a witness. To what? Well, the accident happened at 4th Street and Folsom Avenue. He might want you to swear I was miles away from 4th and Folsom. With you. But what if I didn't say that? What if your father's company never got another subcontract? Oh. Oh, you couldn't do that. Couldn't I? Every construction contract in this town goes through my brother. Now, you see what you're up against? Yes. On the other hand, my brother might be very grateful to the father of a girl that proved I was 15 miles away from 4th and Folsom. I see. So what are you going to do? I guess I have no choice. I mean, for myself, it's one thing, but... But for my pop. Now you're talking. I'll say you were with me and miles away. Fine. But don't get just one idea fixed in your head. Maybe that won't be what Walter Whalen wants you to say. What? Maybe he wants you to say that you weren't with me. Maybe he wants you to say you were at 4th Street and Folsom Avenue when the accident happened and describe the car and give the license number. But how would that help you? I didn't say my license number. Maybe Walter will pick somebody who's been giving my brother a hard time. <laughs> Two birds with one stone. Oh, my God. What's the matter? Don't you know? Do you mean you really don't know what's the matter? You killed a man. <clears throat> Go ahead and hit me. I don't care. You killed a man. <clears throat> Stop saying that. I don't care how much you hit me. I can understand wanting to get out of it yourself, but picking some other man and making me swear someone else did it, you... You're disgusting. You're through? Yes, I'm through. Fine. Because now I'm going... And I'm getting out of here. No, you don't. Yes, let me go. Don't leave me, oh, no. baby. Oh, please. Oh. Please leave me alone. 
<laughs> Don't do that. Where were you tonight? With you. Where? I don't know. Fifty miles away from Fourth and Balsam. If that's what Walter wants, that's where you were? Yes. Yes. Don't hurt me again. And if Walter wants you to say you were at Fourth and Falsam and saw the accident... I'll do anything you say. Anything Mr. Wyland said. Fine. Let's get comfortable till 10 o'clock. And we'll go see Walter. <laughs> Glazer and the young lady. Sit down. This is Anne Villa, Walter. And tell Walter what you're ready to do. I'll, uh, I'll do anything you want me to, Mr. Whalen. I, but I don't like it and I don't want to. I don't know what this is all about, but I certainly don't want you to do anything against your will, Miss DeVillo. She wants to, all right. I imagine, Allie, that means you've arranged for her to fix something or other for you by swearing falsely. So what? Well, I'm not going to be a party to it. Whatever it is, Allie. And my advice to Mr. Billow is not to swear falsely to anything. Where do you get off of that stuff, Walter? Just remember my brother Jim will be back in town in a day or two. I guess you haven't heard, Allie. Jim's back already. What? Yes, he is. Now, Mr. DeVillo... You'd rather tell the truth than some falsehood, wouldn't you? Yes, Mr. Wayland. Well, you can start to do so in a moment. And I sincerely hope it will be very damaging to our friend Allie here. Walter, have you gone crazy? If Jim is back, all I gotta do is pick up that phone and talk to him. Oh, and... but you can't do that, Allie. You see, Jim got back at 4 o'clock this morning. And he was killed by a hit-and-run driver at the corner of 4th and Folsom. <laughs> Hey, weirdos. Our next Weirdo Watch Party is this coming Friday, June 21st. Let nothing stop you. And this time it's a double feature. What a terrible thing. This Friday, Bobby Gamonster presents The Vampire's Ghost from 1954, where a bar owner who is a vampire is tired of living as a vampire. Vampire. And will also be treated to 1961's The Snake Woman, in which a doctor tries to cure his wife's sick mind by injecting her with snake venom, and she gives birth to a very creepy daughter. But that's not possible. That's why it's a horror movie. The fun starts early at 4.30 p.m. Pacific, 7.30 p.m. Eastern. Watch one movie, then… Don't move a muscle. Stay for the second movie. It's a Weirdo Watch Party double feature. You're one of the nicest people I've ever known. Well, thank you very much. Our Weirdo Watch Party is always free to watch online, so grab your popcorn, candy, and soda and jump into the fun and even get involved in the live chat as we watch the show. You will never speak of this. Never. No, actually, you need to tell everyone about this. It's a lot of fun. It's The Vampire's Ghost and The Snake Woman double feature brought to us by horror host Bobby Gamonster. You're seeing a creature that doesn't exist. Oh, he, he totally exists. I've seen him before. And he's a lot of fun. So join us on the Monster Channel page this Friday, June 21st at 4.30 p.m. Pacific, 7.30 p.m. Eastern. We'll see you then. No matter the time of day or season, sometimes you need to find a way to rid yourself of those ghostly chills that bring raised hairs and goosebumps to your skin. Other times you're looking for those ghostly chills. Either way, it sounds like you need a mug of Weird Dark Roast Coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee has deep notes of cocoa, caramel, and a touch of sinister sweetness that'll send shivers down your taste buds. This is an exclusive coffee that I selected specifically for you, my weirdo family. Weird Dark Roast is not available in stores, coffee houses, mad scientist 
labs, or even the dark web, but you can find it at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee – fresh roasted to order so it's as fresh as it can be when it lands on your doorstep and knocks three times. Grab yours now at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee does not actually knock on your door because it doesn't have arms or hands, so if you hear knocks at the door and no one answers when you ask who it is, it's probably paranormal and you should just leave the door shut and locked. Reports of strange creatures and monsters have been around for decades. Centuries, in fact. For example, the first report of the Loch Ness Monster occurred in the 6th century AD. The Bigfoot creatures were seen way back in the 1800s. That's when they were known as wild men. Sea serpents have been around for centuries. You get the picture. Monsters are nothing new. While that's not exactly true, some monsters have surfaced in relatively recent times. Admittedly, that is a weird situation, but it's also true. With that said, let's take a look at just a few of these monster cases of the relatively modern type. We'll begin with the Beast of Bray Road, a werewolf-type thing that, despite what some might think, hasn't been around too long at all. Linda Godfrey, the undeniable expert in the field of monsters, says, since 1991, the Wisconsin town of Elkhorn has been the lair and hunting ground of a terrifying creature that is the closest thing one can imagine to a real-life werewolf. And just maybe that's exactly what it is. The monster has become known as the Beast of Bray Road, on account of the fact that many of the initial sightings were made on that particular road. Without doubt, the expert on all things of lycanthropic nature in Wisconsin is author and journalist Linda Godfrey, who has penned half a dozen books on werewolves and who I interviewed about her research into this malignant beast. She told me the story first came to my attention in about 1991 from a woman who had heard rumors going around here in Elkhorn and particularly in the high school that people had been seeing something like a werewolf, a wolf-like creature or a wolfman. They didn't really know what it was, but some were saying it was a werewolf, and the werewolf tag has just gotten used because I think the people really didn't know what else to call it. Why Bray Road wasn't tagged before 1991 is still unknown. Now onto a monster of the deep that made its debut in recent times. A resident of Lake Windermere, England, Bo Nessie was 100% unheard of prior to 2006. In terms of the publicity stakes, however, it has certainly done a great job in catching up. As for Lake Windermere itself, Britannica.com states the following. The lake is 10.5 miles or 17 kilometers long and 1 mile or 1.6 kilometers wide and has an area of 6 square miles or 16 square kilometers. It lies in two basins separated by a group of islands opposite the town of Bonus on the eastern shore and it's drained by the River Leven. Part of the Lake District National Park, Windermere is a popular tourist center with facilities for yachting and steamers operating in the summer. As the previous data demonstrates, Lake Windermere is much smaller than Loch Ness, yet that has not stopped a mysterious creature from appearing in its depths, which extend to 219 feet at their deepest. Now, with all that said, let's take a look at the saga of Bo Nessie and how and why it's become a monster of the modern era. The first person to have encountered Bo Nessie was a journalist named Steve Burnip, who saw the creature in 2006. He said of his close encounter of the monstrous type, I saw a straight line of broken water with three humps. It was about 20 feet long, and it went in a straight line up the lake. I nudged my wife and watched open-mouthed as it gradually faded from sight. The water was not choppy, so I know it wasn't the wind, and I know what the wake from motorboats looks like, and it wasn't that either. And thus, a monster was born. Then there is the so-called Texas Chupacabra, which isn't really a chupacabra at all, but that's still an undeniably weird thing. 
Ken Gerhardt has spent a lot of time pursuing what's become known as the Texas Chupacabras. They are hairless canids that look like huge rats, but which are actually coyotes. The lack of hair is not due to down-to-earth mange, however. Rather, it's clear these animals are developing in hairless states. There are other anomalies, too. The creatures have strange pouches on their back limbs. They have huge overbites. On occasion, they'll run on their hind legs in a strange, awkward, bouncing fashion. They hunt in the day and do not appear to be intimidated or frightened by the presence of people. This brings us to how and why regular coyotes are quickly turning into something else. Ken has an answer. Many of these Texas chupacabras, he says, have been reported in areas in and around coal-burning power plants. Coal-burning power plants release massive amounts of toxins, including something called sulfur dioxide which, in laboratory tests, has been proven to be a mutagen. This is a toxin that can get into an animal's blood makeup and actually cause their cells to mutate. Maybe as a result of the pollution, the immune systems of these animals have been weakened to the point where, when they do contact the mange mites, their resulting symptoms are much more extreme than anything we've encountered before. This may be why they become completely hairless so fast and why they look so sickly. It might also explain the physical changes like the forelimb lengths, the overbites, and the pouches. And it might also explain why sightings of the Texas chupacabras didn't really begin until the early 2000s. It was because, prior to before that, the pollutant wasn't at a level that was destined to cause problems. Until, that is, the problems did begin, and a monster of sorts began to be seen. Up next, on September 18, 1973, Georgia Governor Jimmy Carter, later our President Carter, filed a report with the National Investigations Committee on Aerial Phenomena claiming he had seen a UFO. That story's up next on Weird Darkness. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media, hear other podcasts that I host, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. And I. Right. Johnny, you hurt? Of course, you pump your own water and plow and get blisters on your hands. I don't mind blisters. Jane, do you think. Of course. Sure. Very sure. If it's with you. And you can have a human name, not a name with a number. I'm Bob. Bob Thomas. All right, Bob. What do we do now? Well, I've got your escape from the city all planned. We go down. What's that? Who's there? The mine police. Electronic men. The robot mine police. Use the visual signal. Let me see you. All electronic disrupted here. Open for inspection. Better open up. All right. Remove device. Causing difficulty. Oh, that, that, that's just an ornament. Remove it. Sure, sure. Take it down, will you, Bob? How's that? Satisfactory. You, guards two and three, investigate other apartments. I will stay. This apartment under protection. Other apartments. We go. I will enter. Start the device again. What? <laughs> 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 it worked, huh? 
you know, Bob has been giving the electronic men fit. <laughs> well, so these are our new friends, eh? Uh, Johnny 212, Jane 16, meet Ralph 98. Hello. Uh, what? He's very much a human being, Johnny. Don't look so surprised. Take off your thin mask and voice box, Ralph. Ralph's one of the best. Our top spy in Mex City. <laughs> Bob, we've got to work fast before the electronic men get back. Bob, things look bad. I think Morton's experiments for the master mechanical brain are succeeding. What? Experiments? For years, Morton's been working to produce electronic men that can make other electronic men. But why? Why? Because the master mechanical brain can control electronic men, absolutely. Humans rebel, like you two. If you had children, what little rebel that be? The master mechanical brain had denied marriage permits to everybody. Except readjusted humans. Yeah, who might just as well be machines. No marriages, no human children. Electronic men that can reproduce their kind. And bingo. A complete machine civilization with a master as ruler. And once the experiments are a definite success, the master will liquidate the human. Oh, no. Oh, oh come, just... Oh, I've read of such things, but, but, but centuries ago. Bob, let's get them out of here. All right, let's... Put... Open mind, Corey. The electronic men are back. Take us now, they'll readjust us forcibly. Oh, well, what do we do? Help me get the metal head mask on and the voice box, too. There, there, Doc. If they find out I'm human, oh. Open door. Electronic man in there. Why did they come back? Johnny, I'm frightened. Bob, Bob, you said you had an escape. I have. But first, Ralph, this is for you. Oh, Bob, Bob, you stuck your friend. It was a trick. We're betrayed. Open. Open. Open the door, Johnny, and rush the electronic man. They won't be expecting violence. All right. Ah, I you. Ah, ah. All right, let up, Johnny, let up. They're both out of commission. Jane. Here. Are you all right? Come on. Head for the emergency chute. bomb shelters, lined with lead for protection against neutron penetration. Now, even the master's electronic scanner can't find us. Now, let's get moving. Yeah. Watch that rubber. Mm -hmm. So, Ralph tried to trick us, eh? I never thought he would do that. He didn't. Yeah. But you said I shouted he betrayed us, so the electronic men would hear and go on believing he was one of them. Knocked out by those vicious renegades. Yeah, that's right. We're Rennies now. But why bother to fool the electronic men? Why didn't Ralph just come with us? He's needed in next city. Without Ralph, we'd have never known about Morton's experiments with a master mechanical brain. And you really think if Morton gets electronic men that can produce others, he'll, he'll kill off all the humans? All but the few that Morton will spare for his own aids and desires. It's a logical thing. Master mechanical brain is supremely logical. We'll have subjects at its absolute command. Careful, Mrs. Oh, yeah. The electronic men act only on impulses the master sends out. They'll act with machine like logic. They won't fall in love. I got it. Disrupt any of Morton's plans for a perfect machine state. Doesn't this, this tunnel ever end? Soon. Duck. Yeah. Oh, ouch! She didn't duck in time. Ducked, all right. I just unducked too quick. Ah, there's a light ahead. The end of the tunnel. Hurry. Yeah. Why? Look at those the stars. They're more beautiful than the pictures. You don't see them under Mech City's dome. What's that funny smell? <laughs> to quote an ancient joke, Johnny, that fresh air. Huh? <laughs> hey, I like it. How do you make it? Johnny, this is real air, fresh air, as nature made it. Huh? And, and, and this is real grass, not synthetic? And those noises, it's like a chorus. Cricket? Frog? Nightbird? It's a whole new world. As a matter of fact, it's a very old one. Here, slip into these capes. Uh, oh, they're, they're cold. Yeah, they're lead mesh. 
Master scanners can't pick him up and trace us and have a blast ray cut us down. Oh, Johnny, I'm scared. You can still turn back. You can say I kidnapped you. Go back to the next city? No. Where Johnny goes, I go. You sure? Very sure. Then follow me. We're only about ten minutes' walk to the caves where I have a jet car we'll take to my farm. I'm so tired. Well, in an hour, you'll be asleep in a feather bed. A real feather bed. I got my first blister. <laughs> ah, this is wonderful. I just can't get over the, the, the realness of things. Your wife served me some milk. Real milk this morning. She's a remarkable woman, Bob. So she tells me. Taking it <laughs> to strangers. Making it at home. Well, she's a pioneer woman. New century style. Is Jane up yet? Of course I'm up. I've been helping Martha cook. Just imagine, Johnny. She actually cooks biscuits and... and and if those men want to eat what I cook, tell them, come and get it. And tell that young man of yours to bring that water in if he's going to wash up for breakfast. <laughs> How do you like that? I get my hands dirty pumping water just so I can wash in the water I pump. <laughs> We're coming, Martha. You're a wonder. We raise all our own food. Real food, Johnny, not synthetic. I raise that bacon from his shoat. The old sow, too. Bob's a great hand with the animals. He'd better be, with six mouths to feed. What? Six? Plus some four kids. Three boys and a girl. Believe me, four growing kids can eat. Well, where are they? Away. Martha always sends them away when I go to Mech City. She's got a notion those trips are dangerous. They are. The master mechanical brain and Morton don't like you snatching their humans. Someday... Oh, nonsense. Wait, it isn't nonsense, Bob. You took a big chance for us. Yes, but why? Why risk all this happiness just for people like us? People you don't even know. Because he feels you're worth it. I think you are, too. And I'm for Bob and all the people he can help. But I'm still afraid... So you send the kid to safety and let him go and... and... wait for him to come back. Even though I'm glad you got us out, Bob, you... you haven't the right to take those chances. Once the master mechanical brain has absolute control, you don't think we'll be safe, do you? As one great American said centuries ago, this union cannot long endure half slave and half free. And that's still true. Even if that slavery is benevolent. Yes. The master is generous. It gave us everything. Except happiness. Bob, uh, you really think it will come after you? As soon as that slimy excuse for a human being, Morton, perfects the electronic men who can produce other men, the master robots will be after us like a shot. Well, that reminds me, it's about time for Morton's morning televox. We don't get the uh, visual part out here, but we can hear Morton. We'll see if there's any mention of your... Uh, Excellent. And in this brutal fight, a band of renegades snatched two humans. Yes, However, the master mechanical brain offers all renegades the opportunity to enjoy the peace and happiness of Mech City. Notice to all renegades, all crimes against Mech City will be forgiven if you surrender now for readjustment. Readjustment. If not, the master mechanical brain will be forced to make readjustment at a distance. Morton never dared to make a threat like that before. Shut it off. I can't stand that cold, inhuman voice. Well, let's hear what he has to say. No. Oh, uh, can he do anything? Who knows what that man can plan with a master mechanical brain. He's got weapons, if that's what you mean. Bob, someone's coming. It's Ralph. Bob, Bob, get to the cave, quick. Why are you here? Had to get away. 
Warden suspects. Ordered tests. All electronic men. But that's not the worst, Bob. The master mechanical brain is turning destroyer waves on all the Rennie farms that you locate. So this is it. Quick, everybody to the bomb cave. Well, you lead the way. I'll save what I can. Don't take a chance, Bob. We started with nothing and we can start again. But not without you. Well, can I? Martha's well, right. Get to the cave. No, no. Oh, hi. I think Morton's success with the electronic men is the cause, Bob. He's so sure I had help the humans in Mech City. Well, we gotta go there and warn you. Oh, no, Bob, please. Here, step behind those bushes. There's a cave in back of them. In here? Yeah. The cave is lead lined. If you go back, Bob, I'm going with you. What's that? The destroyer way. <laughs> The master of part two by two, bolt by bolt. Martha, get on the cave signal system. Alert all the ready. Tell the kids I love them. We're going back. Ralph, sure, I'm going, Danny. You, you mean you're going to try to destroy the master mechanical brain? That's right. The time has come. We can't wait any longer. But, Bob, even if you succeed, even if you're not killed first, you'll paralyze Mech City. No food, no water, no air. How will they live? Unless we destroy the masters, they won't live at all. For the rest... Men lived once before without machines. They can do it again. Well, Johnny, 212. No number anymore. I'll come. I'm going too with no. Johnny. No, you stay with Martha. Martha has something to stay for. Children. I've only got you, Johnny. No, no, Jane. You stay with... Take her with you, Johnny. I know what she needs. We've got to hurry. Bob, if you don't come back... I'll come back with a master mechanical brain in broken pieces. Oh, of course you will. I'll tell the others... Let's go. Bob. Martha. I'll be back. Did you hear that? The master mechanical brain and... Machine 
jealous of humans. Machine with emotion. Yes, it destroys humans because they are humans. For too many centuries, machines have been the servants. Now they will be the masters. Machines will be the world. The master will destroy humans, and the machines will be supreme. All except me. Me. Martin. It's all back to me. You heard it? It's all back. Master. were centered in the master mechanical brain. Everything will stop now. The electronic men, the killings, and the automatic security. James, James, stick close. Hold on to my arm. It's it's all over. That uh, depends on how you look at it, Jane. For humans, for people, it's all just starting again. Mech City destroyed. A whole civilization ruined. No, no, Johnny, no. The two things aren't the same. It's true that Mech City is destroyed. But civilization is something more than machines and apparatus. That's something I learned when I joined the Rennies. Civilizations aren't built, are, are built on dreams and made secure, not by efficiency, but by dedication. Johnny, Jane, you... And all the others who are alive today will soon learn that the pursuit of happiness, the desire to be with those you love, to think and act in freedom as men, that's the true meaning of civilization. That's what makes us human beings in the image of God. Another exciting drama on 2000 Plus, When the World Met. You've heard about the men from Mars. Ever wondered what they'll look like? Ever thought what would happen if the Martians came? Well, listen next week and you'll find out. 2000 Plus is produced by Sherman A. Dreyer and Robert Wen Olson. In today's story, Ken Williams played Johnny, Charlotte Manson played Jane, Joseph Julian was Bob, Hester Sondergaard was Martha. Arnold Robertson was Morton, and Sanford Pickert was Ralph. The orchestra was conducted by Emerson Buckley, music composed by Elliot Jacoby. Script by Donald Stapleton, sound by Walt Shaver and Al Abel. Engineer, Bob Albright. This is Bob Emmerich speaking. Nothing goes better with chocolate than vanilla, and nothing goes better with the darkness than vampires. 
So we've combined all of them into a new blend of weird dark roast coffee called Very Vampilla. This bloody good blend combines a medium dark roast coffee with hints of chocolate, vanilla, and just a tad bit of dried cherry, too. So good, you'll want to sink your fangs into the fresh roasted bag itself. Weird Dark Roast Very Vampilla, the only thing at stake – sorry, not sorry, bad pun – is your dissatisfaction with your old coffee. Sip it while the sun is down if you're one of the undead, or when the sun is up if you just feel dead and need a bit of a boost. Get your Weird Dark Roast Very Vampilla at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Welcome back to Weird Darkness. I'm Darren Marlar. Before Jimmy Carter became the governor of Georgia and then the president, he was a typical small-town guy from rural Georgia with a peanut farm. That down-home, folksy image was solidified in what's become known as the Jimmy Carter UFO incident, which came out during the 1976 presidential election. Jimmy Carter's always stood by his claim that he saw a UFO in Georgia in 1969, although he has been careful not to say that he believed it to be an alien spacecraft. He filed an official report about the incident in 1973 when he was still governor of Georgia. He said the experience led him to have more respect for others who have seen UFOs, and he even promised the American people that, if elected president, he would release all information regarding UFOs to the public upon taking office. So, what did the 39th president see on that fateful day? In October 1969, Jimmy Carter was waiting outside of a Lions Club meeting in the small town of Leary, Georgia. It was about 7.30 p.m. when he first spotted the UFO, which he called the darndest thing I've ever seen. Jimmy Carter's UFO sighting was backed up by about 20 witnesses who also saw the event, and they described it as very bright, changing colors and about the size of the moon. In the September 18, 1973 report he filed with the National Investigations Committee on Aerial Phenomena NICAP, Carter said the object seemed to have no mass, but it lingered in the air for about 10 minutes before disappearing. Over that time, it cycled from a bright blue orb to red and white before receding into the distance. There were about 20 of us standing outside of a little restaurant, I believe a high school lunchroom, he said, and a kind of green light appeared in the western sky. This was right after sundown. It got brighter and brighter, and then it eventually disappeared. Carter didn't think much about it again until it came up on the presidential campaign trail. The 1969 moon landing captivated Americans across the country and led to a small boom of interest in extraterrestrial life as well. By the 1976 presidential campaign, these questions were so prevalent in the United States that UFOs were taking center stage. As it turned out, both Carter and the Republican nominee, Gerald Ford, had experiences with UFOs. In 1966, Ford, who was then a congressman from Michigan, was fielding questions from his constituents about some sightings in the night sky. Are we to assume that everyone who says he has seen UFOs is an unreliable witness? I think we owe it to the people to establish credibility regarding UFOs and to produce the greatest possible enlightenment on this subject, Ford said. Later, Ford admitted that he had taken a special interest in the Michigan sightings, so much so that he'd requested the Armed Services Committee of the House to convene a meeting on the matter. Although Ford never got his request fulfilled, the matter once again took center stage when he ran against Jimmy Carter in 1976. Because of Jimmy Carter's UFO sighting, he had a slightly different take and brought up his own experiences as proof. One thing's for sure, I'll never make fun of people who say they've seen unidentified objects in the sky, he said. If I become president, I'll make every piece of information this country has about UFO sightings available to the public and the scientists. I'm convinced that UFOs exist because I've seen one. 
Jimmy Carter continued to demonstrate an interest in UFOs throughout his presidency. He promised to look into the Roswell incident to investigate any potential cover-ups. An unconfirmed account suggested that then-CIA Director George Herbert Walker Bush told him the full truth about what the government was hiding about UFOs. That meeting reportedly reduced Carter to tears, although no independent corroboration of this event is known to exist, and Carter's always denied believing in extraterrestrial forms of life. In 2005, Carter told GQ magazine that he was able to recount the event with such accuracy in 1973, four years after the incident, because he had taken a tape recorder with him that night and had the witnesses dictate their experience as well. However, he just stopped short of claiming that the UFO was from outer space. It was a flying object that was unidentified, he said, but I have never thought that it was from outer space. As far as covering up possible flights from distant satellites or distant heavenly bodies, I don't believe in that, and there's no evidence that it was ever covered up. Or extraterrestrial people coming to Earth, I don't think that's ever happened. Carter's grandson, Josh, later told Podcast 561 that after the Jimmy Carter UFO incident, his grandfather made the distinction between an unidentified flying object and an aircraft from outer space. The questions around what the 39th president really saw on that fateful Georgia night continue to linger. The most likely explanation comes from Dr. Jeer Justice, who believes that Jimmy Carter actually bore witness to a barium tracer cloud. Citing NASA documents and the former president's official report, Justice's claim has been submitted officially to the Jimmy Carter Presidential Library as an explanation for what Carter saw that night. Ultimately, and despite promising to release information about the UFOs to the public once he became president, Carter declined to do so, citing defense implications to some of the information. To this day, Americans are still waiting. For the most part, pregnancies in people are pretty simple, whether it's natural in vitro or through surrogacy, the steps remain the same. Take an egg and some sperm, get them together, and nine months later, okay, it's an oversimplification, but you get the idea. Of course, not every pregnancy is the same, and some are downright weird. Rare conditions and otherwise impossible pregnancies exist, and many of them may surprise you. These cases are the most unusual pregnancies ever recorded, and they are straight-up weird. Typically, a girl doesn't begin menstruating until she's around 12 years old. While that number certainly fluctuates up or down by a few years depending on the girl, it's the general average for most women around the world. Despite this, there are records of girls beginning their menstrual cycles much earlier. Still, the earliest known example is rather shocking. A Peruvian girl named Lina Marcela Medina gave birth to a child at the tender age of only five years, seven months old. What's even more shocking about that number is the doctors estimated she'd been menstruating since the age of three and was capable of being impregnated that early in life. This wouldn't result in a pregnancy in most cases, of course, but sadly, we don't live in a world where people don't prey on children. When Lena was brought into the hospital for abdominal pain and was found to be pregnant with a seven-month-old fetus, her dad was arrested for rape and incest. Because of her young age, the child was born via cesarean section, and the boy survived. He came in at 5.95 pounds, which was a healthy weight. The viable pregnancy was certainly rare, and no mother has since been recorded at such a young age, and hopefully one never will. We'll continue looking at some of these shocking pregnancy stories when Weird Darkness returns. Are you a member of the Darkness Syndicate? The Darkness Syndicate is a private membership where you receive commercial-free episodes of the Weird Darkness podcast and radio show. 
behind-the-scenes video updates about future projects and events I'm working on. You can share your own opinions on ideas to help me decide upon Weird Darkness contests and events. You can hear audiobooks I'm narrating before even the publishers or authors get to hear them. You also receive bonus audio of other projects I'm working on outside of Weird Darkness. You get all of these benefits and more starting at only $5 per month. Join the Weird Darkness Syndicate at WeirdDarkness.com slash syndicate. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash syndicate. From Hollywood, Marsha Hunt in The Unexpected. The Unexpected. The Unexpected. Life is filled with the unexpected, happy, romantic, tragic, and mysterious endings to our most ordinary actions. Dreams come true or dreams are shattered by sudden twists of fate in The Unexpected. Who knows what strange drama may happen tomorrow, or an hour from now, or in just a moment? Who knows what destiny has in store for the lady down the street, the fellow at the nest desk, or for you, yourself? Who knows? In just a moment, the unexpected. Marsha Hunt, famous motion picture and stage star in a drama of the unexpected, titled Birthday Present. I'm sick of it. Sick of it all. This shabby house with its faded wallpaper and flowered rugs and imitation Chippendale furniture. I'm tired of wearing clothes that were mass-produced and fed up with cheap restaurants that have jukeboxes instead of orchestras. I'm sick of everything second-rate, of this life, even of John, and most of all of myself, because I've let them do it to me. It's my own fault. I let them. Ever since I was a little girl, I let them put me off with substitutes. Always I had to take second best. Ever since I was a little girl. But, Mother, I want a new dress. One that's really my own, not something sis had and you cut down to fit me. Just once, Mother. I wore my sister's dress. I wore all her dresses. And then finally, just before I was leaving to enroll at college, my father bought me an outfit of my own. A whole outfit. Thirty-four ninety-eight in the bargain basement. For a whole day, I thought I was free from substitutes. But that evening, my father said, Anne, I want to talk to you for a moment. Yes, Dad? I know you've got your heart set on going to the university. Oh, I have. You know I have. Well, Anne, you see, things haven't been going too well this year. and Well, you'll have to go to school somewhere else. Oh. You understand, don't you, Anne? Sure. I understand. I'm sorry it can't be the university, but teacher's normal is the next best thing. Yes, I know it is. While I was at Teacher's Normal, I met Roger and fell in love with him. It was as simple as that. We were right for each other, and I knew we'd be married soon. 
course I love you, Anne, and I'd like to marry you, but... But what? I can't. Oh. You've got to understand, and I, I just can't. I've got my family to think of. And they don't know you the way I do. You, you've got to understand. I do, Roger. I do, very clearly. I always understand. So, I married someone else. John. And came to live in this house. I suppose it isn't a bad house, not really... Just empty and colorless, like my life. And that's how it's been, always, ever since I was a little girl. Do you know what it means never to have anything that's right, that's real and glows with being the thing you want? Do you know what it means to take the second best, always the second best, to accept the substitute, smiling just as if you didn't care, until you're sick of everything and you... Almost don't care. And then, suddenly, after years of wanting and not getting, you see one thing, one simple thing you truly desire. It's real and right and wanted. You can afford it practically, and you've got to have it. Not something like it, not a substitute, not a replacement that's just as good and only a little cheaper, but the thing itself. There, catching your eye, tugging at your brain, and telling you, if you don't own me, you'll never have anything you really want. Never, never, never. I'm your last chance. That's what happened just a week ago. I was walking down Franklin Street. I glanced in the window of Mr. Evans' jewelry store, and I saw it. There wasn't anything else in the window... Just a box lined in gray suede, bathed in the glow of a pink spotlight, open and proudly presenting the loveliest gold bracelet I'd ever seen. Good morning, Mrs. March. Is there something I can show you? Yes, Mr. Evans. That square-linked gold bracelet in the window, I... I suppose it must be terribly expensive. Oh, a lovely piece. Quite an unusual design. May I show it to you? If you please. Well, certainly. Here you are. Oh, it's lovely. How how much is it, Mr. Evans? $160 with the tax. Well, that's not too expensive for a gold bracelet, is it? Very reasonable. And if you're interested, we also have the same design. In no. Silk. No, thank you. I wouldn't be interested in anything but the gold. Of course. Here, Mr. Evans, you can put it back in the box. Thank you very much for showing it to me. I'll speak to my husband. I have a birthday next week, oh, and Yes, I... I understand, Mrs. March. I hope you and your husband will be in again this week. I hope so, too. I think it can be arranged, Mr. Evans. I think it can be arranged. <laughs> <laughs> John. Yes, dear? I saw the most beautiful bracelet today in Evan's window. It was just the sort of thing I've always wanted. Oh? Huh? I suppose it's too expensive. Nice things usually are, but it was so perfect, so exquisite. And I thought, well, next week is... Your birthday, I know. <laughs> uh, that reminds me, I wanted to talk to you about your birthday. Oh? I, I thought perhaps this year we could skip some of the extra expense. You've always been reasonable and sensible. <laughs> That's why I married you. No, John. I'm not reasonable and sensible. Not now. Not anymore. I'm tired of being practical and understanding. I I want to be wild and extravagant. I want to have something just once the way I want it, at the time I want it. Oh, please, John, I know I'm being silly. I, I know we can't afford it, but, darling, I do want that bracelet. I can't tell you why or how... But it means more to me than just a piece of jewelry. Somehow, in some way, it stands for everything I've ever wanted. Wanted and not been able to have. Everything. Gee, honey, I didn't know you felt that way. I guess things haven't always worked out like we planned. And I'm sorry. Well, it isn't your fault, John. Not really. I'll do what I can about the bracelet. I, I won't promise, Anne, but I'll do what I can. I know you will, darling. I, I didn't mean to lose my temper. I... You haven't been feeling very oh, forget well. Forget it, Anne. 
Don't apologize. We'll just forget about the whole thing. So John forgot about my outburst. But I couldn't forget the gold bracelet. All week long, I kept telling myself over and over, he had bought it, he had bought it, and I was going to wear the gold bracelet on my birthday. More coffee, John? Uh, No, thanks. I've got to run. I'm a little late this morning. Goodbye, dear. Oh, goodbye. Uh, Is anything wrong? No, no, nothing. Nothing at all. Goodbye. I know. You think I've forgotten, don't you? Well, I haven't. Happy birthday, darling. Here's something for you. Oh, don't keep me in suspense. What is it? Oh, just some candy. Candy? But the box is so small. It isn't candy, John. I can tell here on the paper it says... It says Evans Jewelers. Go ahead and open it. Oh, darling, darling, you did remember. You did. It's the bracelet. I know it's the bracelet. Oh, John, you're wonderful. Life's wonderful. I can't wait to put it on. Well... Don't you like it? Yes. Yes, of course. It's... It's beautiful. Just what I wanted. Oh, thank you, John, for the bracelet. It was a very pretty bracelet. Nestled in a gray suede box, square-linked, exactly like the one in the window, except that this bracelet was made of... silver. You think the story is over, don't you? But wait. Fate takes a hand. Wait for the unexpected. Now for the surprising conclusion to Birthday Present, starring Marsha Hunt, written by Robert Libet and Frank Burt, and produced and directed by Frank K. Danzig. My birthday present, a silver bracelet, not gold, silver, dead white against the gray suede, another substitute. Now I know I'll never have anything the way I want it. I'll always have to take second best, always. No. No, I won't do it. Not this time. I'll go downtown. I've got some money saved. Not much, but my credit's good. Mr. Evans will understand. He'll let me pay off the difference. The gold bracelet can't be much more expensive, and it's the best. I'm going to have it just this once. I'm going to have the best. Good morning, Mrs. March. Happy birthday. (laughs) Of course, you're pleased with the bracelet. It's very nice. There's just one thing. Yes? Yes. I would have preferred the gold, that is, if you haven't sold it. No, we still have it in stock. I could make up the difference, perhaps not right away. Difference? Why, Mrs. March, the difference is about $150 in your favor. That bracelet you have is platinum, one of the very finest we've ever had in the store. Don't you realize that platinum is much more expensive than gold? Platinum? You have a very thoughtful husband, Mrs. March. You're a lucky woman. Oh, yes, Mr. Evans. I guess you're right. I am lucky. Very lucky. And this birthday present is the best I could ever have. The very best. Birthday present starring Marcia Hunt was transcribed in Hollywood. Listen for another exciting story starring one of your favorite motion picture stars who meets the unexpected. <laughs> The 
This is a Hamilton Whitney radio production, presented under the supervision of Alvin C. Gershenson. If you like what you're hearing on Weird Darkness, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can find information on sponsors you heard during the show, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, find other podcasts that I host. You can visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. And if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell of your own, you can click on Tell Your Story. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Welcome back to Weird Darkness. I'm Darren Marlar. Typically, women stop having children in their 40s, but thanks to modern medical practices like in vitro fertilization and various drugs, that's changed. Now, women can get pregnant well into their 40s, but it's rare for pregnancies to happen in the 50s and beyond. That doesn't mean it's impossible, but it is rare. Still, there are unusual cases, such as Amkari Panwar who gave birth to twins at the age of 72. The Indian woman successfully delivered a boy and a girl, and it was all thanks to in vitro fertilization, so it wasn't some sort of strange accident. Both children were born healthy, if a bit premature, though the effort nearly killed the mother. Panwar and her husband, Sharam Singh, had two other children and five grandchildren, but the couple had never had a son. The desire for one was so strong they went forward with implantation despite the risks. Such a practice is certainly frowned upon, but in India, where it's illegal for a doctor to reveal the sex of a child, having a son is important. This desire often leads to the abortion of healthy female fetuses, hence the law of doctors not being able to reveal the sex. Believe it or not, it's possible to become pregnant while already pregnant, though it is incredibly rare. The phenomenon is called superfetation, and there are only around 10 cases known to exist in all of recorded medical history. One such case involved Julia Grovenberg, who became pregnant with her second son, Hudson, while she was pregnant with her first daughter, Julian. Hudson was conceived around two weeks after her sister's conception, so the two were close enough in age to pass for twins. Ultimately, that's how the parents passed the kids off, as they were both born simultaneously, making that pretty easy. Interestingly, though, superfetation can occur with more than one father, making it possible to carry two children from two different fathers at the same time. This actually occurred in 2017 when an American surrogate for a Chinese couple became pregnant with two children. The first was the implanted embryo, the second was the result of a biological impregnation between her and her partner. The two pregnancies were separated by about three weeks and technically stemmed from two mothers and two fathers. While it is exceptionally rare for a woman to get pregnant while she's already pregnant via superfetation, there is another way multiple pregnancies can occur. Some women are born with more than one uterus, a condition known as didelphes. It's next to impossible for these women to become pregnant in both uteri at the same time, but it can happen. The odds of it occurring are only around 1 in 5 million, so there aren't many recorded cases. A recent occurrence happened in 2010, when Angie Cromar managed to have two babies at once, but they weren't twins. Twins form from either two eggs and a different sperm for fraternal twins, 
or a single fertilized egg that splits for identical twins but develop in the same uterus. Development in different uteri of the same mother is entirely different, so the offspring are not considered twins at all. Essentially, it's two separate eggs and two sperm cells, both of which combine separately, so the offspring are siblings but not twins. Still, they are often called non-genetic twins, which is not necessarily incorrect. It is incredibly rare, and only about 100 instances have been recorded. Theoretically, a didelphus pregnancy could result from two separate fathers. Becoming pregnant while pregnant is rare, but it can happen in a variety of ways. Superfetation results in pregnancy on top of pregnancy, but it's not the only way a woman can become pregnant twice. A more common double pregnancy can occur simply by having sex with multiple partners in a short period of time. Typically, a woman drops a single egg when she ovulates, but occasionally she can drop more. When this happens, one or both can become fertilized by separate sperm cells. Sperm can survive for up to five days following the insemination, and that whole time they're just waiting around to find an egg. If one of those cells finds that second egg, it can fertilize that too, even if the woman was already impregnated around that same time. One such case occurred in 2009 when a Texas woman delivered twin boys. The father noticed how different they looked and asked for a paternity test. The results were baffling because while both children were born simultaneously, they each had a different biological father. This phenomenon, called heteropaternal superfecundation, accounts for between 1 and 2 percent of all fraternal twins. It's even resulted in the birth of twins where the children are different races due to the fathers being white and black. When an American woman gave birth to eight children at once in 2009, she became a reality star and a Guinness World Record holder. Octomom had some competition in 2021, though, when a Malian woman named Halima Sisa gave birth via cesarean section to nine babies at once, five girls and four boys, and they all survived. That's an important distinction because the previous two recorded instances of non-uplets births, that's nine at a time, resulted in all of the children passing away after only a few days. Fortunately, Sisa avoided that horrific outcome and her children all came into the world as healthy little ones. They weighed in pretty small, 1.1 to 2.2 pounds each, so they needed to spend the first two to three months of their lives inside incubators, where they continued to grow and mature. Delivering the non-uplets was a significant ordeal requiring a team of 10 doctors and 25 paramedics at the Ain Borgia Clinic in Casablanca. Typically, multiple pregnancies like Mrs. Sisa's result from fertility treatments and are not the result of natural impregnation. It's unknown if this is the case for Sisa, but it's possible that it can be done naturally. During in vitro fertilization, Multiple embryos are harvested to increase the probability of producing a viable pregnancy. It's common for people to keep the leftover embryos in cold storage so that they can use them at a later date. Sometimes they're donated to programs that handle embryo adoption, so infertile people can use them to have a child. Typically, stored embryos aren't held in cryogenic preservation for more than a few years. Still, there are cases when an embryo was stored and used after a much longer period of time. Tina Gibson and her husband Ben managed to obtain two embryos stored in a cryogenic freezer and both of them broke records. Their first child came from a frozen embryo that was extracted and put on ice 24 years earlier. When they decided to have another child, they went back to the source so their kids would be genetic siblings. Two embryos from the same donor were implanted and one took. The resulting baby came from a frozen egg donated in 1992 a full 27 years before the Gibsons implanted it. It's the longest period of time an egg spent between extraction, freezing, thawing, and implementation that resulted in a viable pregnancy. In this case, the baby was actually older than the parents, if you consider conception the beginning of life. Medical dramas, and even Monty Python's The Meaning of Life, have delved into the surprise pregnancy trope over the years so many think it's somewhat common. It actually is not, and when a surprise birth comes along, it can create a whole host of problems for everyone involved. Surprise births, or cryptic pregnancies, 
occur when a woman has a mild to a complete absence of pregnancy symptoms. No morning sickness, cramping, minimal abdomen swelling, and more can leave a woman thinking she's not pregnant. Many even continue to menstruate. In April 2021, Melissa Surgkoff gave birth to her son while sitting on a toilet. She thought she was passing a kidney stone. Stories like this pop up every once in a while, and cryptic pregnancies are definitely rare, but they do happen more often than you might think. Patrick O'Brien, an obstetrician at University College London Hospitals, sees about one every year. In some cases, the unknowing soon-to-be mother spent her entire pregnancy menstruating with regularity, so the baby is genuinely unexpected. These pregnancies can be problematic because the mother missed out on all the prenatal care. If you've ever watched a sitcom involving a pregnant woman, odds are you've seen somebody complain about their baby skipping their due date. It's a common trope, and it's also fairly common for women outside the world of entertainment. Most pregnancies last for an average of 280 days, which is a little more than nine months in a day. That's the average. But plenty of children are born too early, or a little late. And then there's the case of Beulah Hunter, a woman who spent the longest time being pregnant. Hunter gave birth to her daughter, Penny Diana, after 375 days, earning herself a place in the record books and a story to tell for the rest of her life. The unusual pregnancy sparked skepticism that Hunter miscarried and then quickly became pregnant once more during her year of pregnancy. Her doctors, though, quickly squashed that notion, and by all accounts, she was genuinely pregnant and her baby was born a hundred days overdue. Hunter's daughter was perfectly healthy and without any unusual developments. Doctors concluded that her womb was healthy, but her daughter developed at a slower rate than normal. Her gestation had a few stops and starts in terms of development, which is what kept her around for so long. And if your mother ever let you know that she suffered for a long time delivering you and that you should be thankful for that, well, yeah, you, you, you should appreciate her, because she's right about that. Still, her intense pain that lasted upwards of 10-plus hours, it does sound horrible. It probably was horrible. But it doesn't really count as the worst labor pains on record. That distinction goes to Joanna Christoken, a Polish woman who suffered far longer than most. Instead of the most typical 8-12 to 12 hours of labor pains felt by most mothers, Rostokin endured a disturbingly long 75 days. Not 75 hours, 75 days. That's 1,800 hours of intense labor pains. She went into early labor at 21 weeks while carrying triplets. The first was born soon after, but it was too early to survive, sadly, leaving two still inside her womb. The labor pains didn't end, though, nor were the other children delivered. Instead, her contractions continued. To help her children survive, her doctors placed her in a bed tilted at a 30-degree angle with her feet up. She remained in that position for 75 days, experiencing labor pains the entire time. Fortunately, after that insanely long period of time, she delivered the remaining two children safely. Christokin suffered some balancing issues soon after the birth, but she has since recovered. Strange creatures, gruesome murders, oozing organisms, unfathomable abductions, enigmatic expeditions, an age-old malevolence, and much more. Author J.C. Moore delivers a collection of dark horror tales that are both chilling and poignant. Dark Intrigues Book 1 is filled with horror fiction for fans of short story anthologies, horror collections, ghost fiction, suspense, Possession, and more. Dark Intrigues Book 1 by J.C. Moore, available on Kindle or as an audiobook narrated by Darren Marlar. Find Dark Intrigues Book 1 on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash audiobooks.
mortal men come many shadows. Shadows of greed and hate, jealousy and fear. Shadows which fog the minds of men and women, which urge them on into their venture in the dark. Dark Venger. The American Broadcasting Company presents Dark Venture, written by Larry Marcus, directed by William T. Johnson, and featuring an all star cast. And now, your host for tonight's Journey into Darkness, John Newland. Tonight, the city has a fable to unfold for those who would follow us through the summer darkness. It is not quite 11 o'clock in the city. The street lamps are glowing targets for mosquitoes and moths. The endless miles of neon tubing slashing the darkness with garish reds and blues and greens. Traffic moves quickly down the street. The sidewalks are filled with sleepless citizens, fruitlessly searching for some wayward breeze. But here, where our story begins, here in this dark alley... There was only George, a skinny, scrawny bum, whose bed for tonight is a strip of cobblestones behind a row of trash. It would be interesting to wonder what the old bum dreams about as he sleeps in the alley, but there is no time, for now suddenly, George is no longer alone. Get out, Joe. Now listen. Get out. Listen to me. You got me all wrong. Get out. No, but, but wait, listen to me. Start walking down the alley. Harry, I'm begging you. Give me a break. Harry, I'm begging you. I'm begging you. Start walking. Then Harry, listen it's a dark to me. dark alley. Maybe you can get away. Harry, you mean you'll let me get away? You, you mean you'll tell the boss you couldn't help her? Is that what you mean, Harry? You never can tell. Oh, Harry, I always said you were okay. I always knew it. Go on, start down the alley. Sure. Sure, sure. And the boss will believe you, too, Harry. It's a dark alley. Past it, Joe. Walk fast. Yeah. So long, Harry. And thanks. Run, Joe. Run. Run. Yeah, run. Almost at the scrawny bum's feet. The car races away, and now George, the bum, is alone in the alley with the dead man. Gotta get out of here. Can't be found with this guy. They might blame me. Gotta get out. Gotta get out. Hey, but wait. Use your head, George. Look at the clothes this guy's wearing. Even in the dark, you can see how classy they are. Eh, he's really got a roll in his wallet, and... He don't need it anymore. Now, hurry. Can't we stay time? Here. Here's his wallet. Hey, stop. I think they came from this alley. Come on. Cops. Got to get out of here. But as George turns to run, the wallet drops from his nervous fingers. No. The money scatters across the cobblestones. He has no time to look for it in the dark. The police are already coming up the alley. He grabs the first bill his fingers touch and then starts running. <laughs> George doesn't stop running till half a dozen blocks separate him from the alley and the dead man and the police. Now, finally, he slows down to a walk where the people on the street are staring at him. Fearful that they might wonder what he clutches so tightly in his fist, he steps into a doorway, opens his hand. By the dim hallway light, he looks. A ten-dollar bill. Now, I'll bet there was fifty of them in that wallet, and all I got was one. Well, no use crying about it now. Anyway, there's still a lot of things a guy can do with a $10 bill. A $10 bill. But this is a very special $10 bill. And you are not to lose sight of it for an instant. For in a sense, you might say, the hero of our journey into darkness tonight is this $10 bill. Now George folds the bill into a pocket, heads across Fifth Avenue to Charlie's Tavern. Not many in Charlie's place tonight, the usual crowd. Everybody's edgy, it's hot. 
It's too hot tonight to get much of a kick out of seeing old George Mosey in. Hi, fellas. Hot night, isn't it? Oh, and here's Charlie, the best darn bartender that ever scraped a head off a glass of cold beer. I don't think none of the boys is in the mood to set you up tonight, George. Why don't you beat it? Just a minute, just a minute now. Uh, how many times would you say I mooch drinks off you fellas, huh? So many. Yeah, 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 too many times, but I always give you a laugh, didn't I? Old George always give you a laugh for setting them up. George, huh? go on, beat it. Oh, oh, all old George had to do was say... This is a fine end for a fellow who studied business administration at Princeton University. And, and, and then you all had a good laugh at old George. Well, tonight's going to be different. Look, will you scram out of here? Tonight, old George is going to set him up for you boys. Every one of you. Ten dollars worth. And, and this time, when he tells you about Princeton, this time, you're not going to laugh at all. Set him up, Charlie. Anything they want, ten bucks worth. That's all that does it. Get out of here. Well, what are you talking about? I, I told you to set him up. And I told you to get out, you drunken bum. Huh? What are you going to try to pull ten bucks worth? No, 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 I, I got the Get out. No, no, hey. Out, out, out. So before George can pull the ten dollar bill out of his pocket, he finds himself sitting on the sidewalk. And through the screen door come the laughs and taunts of those inside. He picks himself up, shakes his head, starts shuffling down the street. Oh, drunken bum. Laughing at me like that. Not even giving me a chance to show him my money. What do they think they are? Old drunken bums. And suddenly George stops. He is looking into a store window where orange-faced dummies gracefully display the very latest fashion in second-hand clothing. But George is not looking at the dummies or the clothing. He is watching his own reflection. His torn, faded shirt, his baggy pants, patched, food-stained, and greasy. Old bum. Old bum. You interested in some nice garments, mister? Uh? I seen you standing there looking at the display. Oh. Why don't you come inside and look around? Don't hurt to look. But I so can't. you can't buy, you can't buy. Look, between me and you, I ain't had a customer inside the store for so long. Even a guy just looking would be a relief. Well, all right. <laughs> eh, sit by myself. All I do is think. What do I think about? How the lousy business has ruined my nerves. How I treat my wife, Eva. <laughs> like she was a dog. Well, maybe maybe I do want to buy... I mean, uh, I could use some clothes, I guess, and, and I got a little money. How little? Ten dollars. A little money? Mister, for ten dollars, you could get dressed from head to bottom and maybe have a couple of bucks left. What? I got good values. Only today, who buys second-hand clothes? Here, take a look at this suit. Feel the material. Sixty percent wool, wears like that. And in a very short time, George, the old bum, finds himself in the washroom behind the store, changing into his new second-hand clothes. Then he finds a razor on the sink. He shaves himself, combs back his hair. After that, he walks out. Say, hey, hey, that looks more like it. Look, look at yourself in the mirror. Well, yeah, looks pretty good, doesn't <laughs> it? Pretty good, terrific. You really look like something. Well... Well, you know, I wasn't always a bum. Once I was headed for big things, I I even studied business administration at Princeton University. Yeah? Say, that's a pretty good college. You... you believe me? Why shouldn't I believe you? You look like a man who has a head for that stuff. I, I got sidetracked, that's all. A lot of bad luck and then... Everything went to pieces. So what? The guy can bounce back. Look, I bet you could go out tomorrow if you told people about this Princeton deal. I'll bet you could name your own job. You really think so? Sam Bernstein never says anything you don't think. Life's too short. It'll be $8 even. Yeah, here's a $10 bill. Hey, yeah? Uh, your change. Uh, you wouldn't know of any... Uh... A fairly good hotel around here, would you? Well, yes, certainly. It's a place down the street where you get a room for a buck and a half. So it's not fancy, but it's clean. Fine. I want to get a good night's sleep. I got a lot of things to do tomorrow. <laughs> good night. Oh, say, mister, 
Wait a second, sir. What do you want me to do with your clothes? <laughs> do anything you want. What would I have use for them? Those clothes are only good for an old bum. And George leaves the secondhand store and disappears into the night. Maybe tomorrow night he'll sell his new clothes for a pint of gin. Then again, let's hope he won't. It's almost 11.30 when Sam closes the store. He walks down the street toward the bus stop. The $10 bill is in his pocket with the other money. The bus is late, and he waits in the doorway of the Pearson flower shop. Mr. Pearson is closing up and taking the flowers out of the window. Sam watches him and remembers how long it has been since he brought Eva, his wife, anything. Before he knows it, he's going inside the shop. Well, hello. I, uh, <clears throat> I just got a minute before I catch my bus. I thought maybe I'd like to buy their little flower. I'm sorry, but I'm closed for a night. Yeah, but look, I want to bring my wife home a little something, you know, and I... Why don't you come I'd back just... tomorrow? I don't want it tomorrow. I want it now. I'm sorry. So, look, I... buddy, that flower there on the desk. Now, what does it take to put in a little box and give it to me? How about it, huh? That's an orchid. Orchid? Yes, it's pretty expensive. Six dollars. Six bucks for one flower? Yeah. <clears throat> okay, wrap it up. Give it to me. Well, all right. I suppose I can. Will this box be all right? Sure, sure. You don't even have to tie it. Here, just ten dollars. Oh, don't you have anything smaller? No. Well, I put all the money in the safe. I've only got a dollar. Hey, well, that's my bus coming down the street. I I got my own store block away. Just give me the dollar. I'll pick up the rest tomorrow. All right. <laughs> if that's all right with yeah, you. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Coming here with a $10 bill, and all I got to show for it is one buck and a flower. I don't know. I guess maybe it's love. And now the florist has the $10 bill. He folds it into a tiny square and stuffs it into his watch pocket. He yawns and finishes putting the flowers into the ice box, and by 10 to 12, he's finished. He washes up and back, straightens his tie, turns out the lights... And starts for the front of the store. In the darkness, someone is waiting for him. Who is it? Never mind. Just stay where you are. I'm not kidding with this gun. Gun? Yeah. Yeah, just hand over the door, mister. Uh, money's in the safe. Then open the safe. I, I can't. It's automatic. It can only be opened by... Look, maybe you think I'm kidding with this gun. Maybe you think I won't use it if I have to. Take it easy. Take it easy. I, I told you the safe is... Never not... mind the safe. Give me what you got on you. I haven't got a penny on Look, wise guy... I'm telling you, I'm going to kill you. Maybe you think I ain't got the guts. Maybe that's what you think. No, I... Hand over your dough. I told you, I don't have a penny. Okay, I'm going to show you. Wait. Yeah, I, I forgot. I do have some money. Ten dollars. Hand it over, quick. Uh, in my watch pocket. Here it is. Okay, mister. That's better. Maybe I ought to let, it, let you kiss this dough before I take it. It just saved your life. <laughs> So now our $10 bill is in the hands of a young thief, running now down a dark side street. His face plastered with sweat, his heart beating wildly against his ribs. I knew I could do it. I knew I could do it. Even in the darkness, it's easy to see his youthfulness. The slender, undeveloped shoulders, the smooth, unshaven face, the kid mouth sagged open, gasping in air as he runs. Not so bad my first job. So was that guy scared. Oh, man, was he scared. What is not apparent in the darkness are the years that brought the boy to this street on this night with a gun in his pocket and a stolen $10 bill. The poverty, the loneliness, the many hungers. Now the boy slows down, standing under a street lamp, puts the $10 bill into his wallet. At this moment, a little man in a doorway, biting a toothpick, smiles and glides out of the shadows. Hey, buddy. Huh? What do you want? Hey, uh, buddy, you wouldn't by any chance be having a match for my cigarette now, would you? Oh, yeah. Here's a pack. Keep it. Oh, thank you. Thank you very kindly. But John Forrest is not a man to keep what ain't his under no circumstances. No, sir. So I'll just strike one of your fine matches. Light my cigarette. And deposit the book of matches right in the same pocket that you took them out of. Hey. And now, begging your pardon, sir, I will proceed on my way. Good night, and thank you. Yeah. Yeah, beat it. The young thief continues down the dark street. 
not quite sure where he's going, but glorying in his newfound courage. Then just ahead, he sees a pair of headlights coming his way. The cops. Gotta get out of here. Gotta get in front of the gun. Time for us, shoot. Okay, okay. What do you want from me? I, I didn't do nothing. Just stand still. Oh. What are you doing that for? I don't carry no gun if that's what you're looking for. Come on over to the squad car with me. Sure. The only reason I ran, I I got kind of rattled, so... Yeah. All right, Mr. Pearson. Take a good look at him. Is he the one I held you up? Uh, I don't know. Like I said, I didn't see much of his face in the dark. How about his voice? The fellow who held me up was pretty excited. I don't know. Well, he's not carrying a gun. I don't know any other way. Oh, wait. Yeah? Uh, look at his wallet. See if he has a $10 bill. Oh, hey, now. Uh, what would that prove? Well, if he doesn't have a 10 spot, at least it proves he isn't the one. If he does, well, I don't know. He might be. Let me see what kind of money you're carrying, son. No. You ain't got no right okay, to search me. Okay, I'll find it myself. Stand still. Hey, you. All right. Now, this isn't our man. He don't have a dime on him. Did you look in his wallet? He doesn't have a wallet. Oh. Go on, buddy. Beat it. This is one time when it's lucky not to have a $10 bill. <laughs> Two blocks away, a spindly-legged little man, still smiling, throws away an empty wallet and pockets our $10 bill. <laughs> yeah, punk kid. <laughs> he really thought I was drunk. <laughs> I could have picked his pocket with my teeth. The little man walks through the night humming to himself, his eyes darting up and down the dark streets till suddenly he stops like a man who suddenly beholds an image of unbelievable loveliness. Hey, a liquor store. Open this late? Uh, it's locked. But all the lights are on. And there's a fellow working inside. Hey, hey, open up, young fella. Open up. No, I ain't gonna go away. Open up. Don't you believe a locked door when you see it? We're closed. Well, with all the lights burning and, and you in your shirt sleeve? I'm taking inventory, that's all. Come back tomorrow. Oh, no, wait, no, wait. Tomorrow, that's a poor word. What is tomorrow but a great big question, Mark? Yeah, yeah, okay, good night. No, no, wait, no, wait a minute. Take your foot out of the door. Oh, man, can't you see? I'm ready to drop just for a little teeny bottle or something or other, huh? Sorry, sorry. But, 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 I I got money. Look, a $10 bill. It's after three in the morning. I can't sell you anything. Didn't you ever hear about the law? Law. That's another word that don't bring no joy to my heart. Look, pal. I only work here. I'm tired. I want to go home. Yeah, look. Hey, that uh, that bottle of bourbon standing over there. Yeah? Uh, you could just reach back and grab it without even stretching your little finger. Now, look, I told you, it's, didn't uh, I? It's marked, uh, it's marked $6 plus tax, right? Now, I'll just give you this $10 bill for it, and I won't even complain a bit. In fact, uh, I'll be the happiest guy in the world. Pal, you picked the right man. You know... I guess it's like they say. Takes a heel to know a heel. Hand over the tent. So by 3.20, our $10 bill is owned by a clerk in a liquor store, a clerk named Eddie. And by a quarter to four, Eddie's locking the store, starting his walk across town to his rented room in 4th Street. But at this time of night, Eddie doesn't mind that walk so much. In the darkness, Eddie can relax. Even dropped a scowl that's his defense against whatever life might do to him. Eddie's never had much faith in life, and what little he had, he lost in the mud before casino. Now Eddie's out to get whatever he can, any way he can. He's thinking about that now as he reaches the bridge that spans the North River. Then he sees the girl standing near the middle of the bridge, looking down. To him. What's she doing here? Maybe she's lonely. Maybe I'll say hello. Hey, what's she trying to do? Hey, lady, don't do that. Get off that ledge. Get off that ledge. Leave me alone. Show me. Take care of you. Call me. Call me. You're not going to stop me. Yeah, yeah, I am going to stop you. Come on now, relax. I'll we'll slug you right on that chin. Why don't you leave me alone? It's none of your business. Why don't you hey, leave hey, me alone? Hey, 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 take it easy. I think that's a prowl car coming across the bridge up three in the camp for trying something like this. Oh, no. Here. Make like we just stopped to light a cigarette here. That's a prowl car, all right. Okay, it's passed. 
You aren't going to stop me. Nobody's going to stop me. As soon as you leave, I'm going to do it anyway. Uh, that's your business. That's right. Only I don't know why a good-looking dame like you wants to do something like this. You know, uh, if you weren't so skinny, you'd really be something to write home about. What's the trouble? Go on. Beat it. Sure, I'll beat it. You can jump nice as you please. Only I got a nice long way to walk till I get to my room, and I always like to have something to think about while I walk, so uh, you tell me why a swell-looking dame like you has to kill herself, and I'll think about that. Yeah. And if I tell you, maybe you'll even help me, since I'm such a swell-looking dame. Sure. Uh, sure you can't tell. Everybody's always willing to help a swell-looking dame. And all they want in return is maybe a little gratitude. Well, after all, it's only humor. Yeah, sure. Go on. Leave me alone. No, uh, uh, now you got me really interested. That'd be like leaving a good movie right before the best part. Oh, please, leave me alone. You tell me, and then I'll go. Look, it won't be so bad. We can finish these cigarettes. It's a nice night. Besides, what does a couple of minutes mean to you? One way or the other. Okay, Mr. Big Shot. Yeah. I'll tell you fast and sweet. And all I need is a couple of violins playing softly in the background. Which version do you want? Annie, the sewing machine girl, a little Nell making paper flowers in her dark bedroom. Or maybe you want to hear about Helen. That's me. The big blonde who was going to come to the city and set it on fire, sing and dance and act, and you name it. It's right up Helen's alley. Maybe you want to hear about her. Only she found out that setting the city on fire wasn't such a lead pipe cinch after all. Not when the city was nothing but cold steel. My holding your interest. Yeah, yeah, go on. You're doing fine. Oh, it gets better as it goes along. Maybe you want to follow our Helen through all the neon dives she worked in. Maybe you'd like to see her. And the girl tells Eddie everything. And she's right. There should have been violins playing in the background. Because it's really a very trite little story. About a pretty blonde kid getting no place fast. About the late hours, the stale cigarette smoke, the sandwiches grabbed on the run, finally taking their toll. Yep, and like all trite little stories, there's even a doctor in it. And he says what the doctor in the story always says. Mild TB. But it'll kill you if you don't get away. And of course, there's a sister in Arizona who'll put her up till she gets well. If she'll only grab a bus and come right out. And all that stands in the way is $37. But in three months of trying... She hasn't been able to make it. When she passed the bridge, she wasn't thinking about suicide, but then... Then suddenly she was very tired. And jumping into the water seemed the only sensible thing in this world to do. Finally, the girl finishes. The two stand in the dark for a very long time. Well? I don't believe any of it. Hey, no. I think you're a cheap little shill trying to talk me out of some dough. Good for you. Now you can be on your way. Good night. Wait. I'm not finished. Yeah. Sure, that's what I believe. Then, uh, I'm a guy that's all twisted up like a pretzel. And because I believe it, that doesn't have to make it so. Uh, how much dough do you need? Oh, now, listen. Look, girlie, get it fast before I start thinking about it. How much dough do you need? I... How much dough? If I can get a bus out of here in just two hours, it'll take me all the way for $37. That's with meals. Honey, I got about six dollars. Yeah. You need 31 more. Yeah. This is your lucky night. Usually I wouldn't have that much with me, but a guy slipped me an extra ten. Come on. You said the bus leaves in two hours. We've got to be getting down to the station. At 6 a.m., a sleepy little crowd has gathered around the door of a bus marked Phoenix. The girl is the last to get on. Well, I guess I'd better get my feet, Eddie. Yeah. Uh, good night, kiddo. I don't know what to say except thank you. Oh, it's okay, me and Rockefeller, you know. Well, go on, you better get on the bus. Yeah. Uh, I'll be going. So long. So long. Hey, Helen, wait a minute. Don't get on the bus yet. Well, uh, it, Eddie. Uh, you know... I'm, I'm always thinking someday I might go out to the West Coast. Yeah. 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 Y
just a second. Eddie, you were saying... And, and if I do, well, I, I got to go through Phoenix. And uh, maybe, uh, well, maybe if you give me your sister's address, maybe, uh, maybe I'll look you up. Oh, Eddie, just look in the phone book. It's listed under Amelia Benson. Amelia Benson. Amelia yeah, Benson. She's the only one in the book. Oh, that is... Uh, this is if you want me to look you up. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, I do want you to look me up. I do, Eddie. I do. I do. I do. I do. And so it is dawn in the city. And as the sky lightens, an old man in a hotel room on 4th Street has just awakened and is carefully putting on his new suit. In a flat on Harrison Street, an orchid rests, still fresh, in an icebox put there by a grateful wife. Across town, in a Wentworth Street studio, a florist stirs in his sleep, as if suddenly reliving his moments with the gunman in the dark and the $10 bill that saved his life. In a small bedroom near Logan Square, a young kid is thinking about that $10 bill, too, and wondering how he could have lost it, but thankful that he did, because losing it has given him another chance. In a store doorway on 12th Street, the pickpocket is sleeping off a drunk, dreaming of a happy world he's never known. Down 6th Street, Eddie is walking toward his room, whistling to himself and wondering if maybe by next month he'll be able to buy his bus ticket for Arizona. And on the outskirts of the city, in a fast-moving bus, a girl looks out the window. She sees a reflection in the glass and realizes that for a very long time, she's been smiling. Only at the ticket window of the bus company is there any real unhappiness as the cashier shakes his head, yells to his assistant. Hey, Frank, where'd you get this bill? Huh? I don't know why. It's counterfeit, that's why. Huh? Yeah, as phony as they come. What are you going to do with it? What can you do with it? <laughs> uh, I guess there's nothing in the world as worthless as a phony $10 bill. Moral? Oh, I kind of think you've already figured out the moral for tonight's story. And I guess it goes something like this. In this life, nothing is ever counterfeit that brings people happiness. Of course, that doesn't mean you should go right out and start printing $10 bills. Good night, folks. See you next week. Listen next week for another dark venture with John Newland. Starring in tonight's story were Jack Moyles as Harry, Jack Edwards Jr. as Joe, Norman Field was George, the old bum, David Ellis was Eddie, Sam Edwards was the thief, Wilms Herbert as Mr. Pearson, the florist, Eddie Marr was Sam, Herb Vigran, the pickpocket, and Virginia Gregg as the girl. Original music by Rex Corey. George Fenneman speaking. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Hey, weirdos. Our next Weirdo Watch Party is this coming Friday, June 21st. Let nothing stop you. And this time it's a double feature. What a terrible thing. This Friday, Bobby Gamonster presents The Vampire's Ghost from 1954, where a bar owner who is a vampire is tired of living as a vampire. Vampire. And will also be treated to 1961's The Snake Woman, in which a doctor tries to cure his wife's sick mind by injecting her with snake venom, and she gives birth to a very creepy daughter. But that's not possible. That's why it's a horror movie. The fun starts early at 4.30 p.m. Pacific, 7.30 p.m. Eastern. Watch one movie, then… Don't move a muscle. Stay for the second movie. It's a Weirdo Watch Party double feature. You're one of the nicest people I've ever known. Well, thank you very much. 
Our Weirdo Watch Party is always free to watch online, so grab your popcorn, candy, and soda and jump into the fun and even get involved in the live chat as we watch the show. You will never speak of this. Never. No, actually, you need to tell everyone about this. It's a lot of fun. It's the Vampire's Ghost and the Snake Woman double feature brought to us by horror host Bobby Gamonster. You're seeing a creature that doesn't exist. Oh, he, he totally exists. I've seen him before. And he's a lot of fun. So join us on the Monster Channel page this Friday, June 21st at 4.30 p.m. Pacific, 7.30 p.m. Eastern. We'll see you then. Welcome back to Weird Darkness. I'm Darren Marlar. If you have a true paranormal story that has happened to you or someone you know, you can share it by clicking on Tell Your Story at WeirdDarkness.com, or you can call the Dark Line toll-free at 1-877-277-5944. That's 1-877-277-5944. I might use your story in a future episode. According to local legend, there was once a terrifying mythical creature that tortured the village of Wirwall, Hampshire, England. The quiet village, which is located along the River Test, only has about 500 residents, but this small little village is also famous for a creepy monster that allegedly lurked around at one time. The legend states that a duck laid an egg in Wirwall Abbey, but it was hatched by a toad and the baby turned into a cockatrice that had several different animal body parts. It appeared as a two-legged, dragon-like monster with a rooster's head and body, the wings of a bat, and a snake's tail. Locals cared for the baby creature until it grew to a massive size and began feeding on the villagers by flying over the land and grabbing people with its claws before bringing them to its lair where it would feed on them. Villagers were so scared of the beast, they offered four acres of land to anyone who would kill it. While numerous people died while attempting to rid the land of the monster, one local apparently accomplished the task as described. A man named Green polished a piece of steel until it gleamed like a mirror and lowered it down to the beast's lair. Upon seeing its reflection, the cockatrice fought until it was exhausted, and then Green ran the beast through with a javelin and claimed his reward. Today, in Harewood Forest, there is still an area known as Green's Acres. Oddly enough, trees don't grow at Green's Acres. It's a good thing the cockatrice was allegedly killed, as the legend has described it as being one terrifying monster. If you or someone you know is struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction, please visit the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com. There, I've gathered numerous resources to find hope and solutions. For those suffering from thoughts of suicide or self-harm, there is the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline, as well as the Crisis Text Line. Both have trained counselors at all hours to help those in need, and the page even includes text numbers for those in the U.S., Canada, United Kingdom, and Ireland. Those struggling with depression can get help through the Seven Cups website and app, and there's information for anyone to read more about what depression truly is and how to identify it through our friends at ifred.org. There are resources for those who battle addictions, be it drugs, alcohol, or self-destructive behavior, along with help for those related to addicts. The page has links to help you find a therapist or counselor, to find help for those who have a family member with Alzheimer's or dementia, help for those in a crisis pregnancy, and more. These resources are always there when you or someone you love needs them on the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com. Out the past, stories strange and weird. Bellkeeper, pull the bell. 
so all may know we are gathered again in the weird circle. This is the history of the House of Usher. I am leaving it as my last will and testament because before this year is over, the cavernous tarn will close over the gables of our decadent home. It was written by our ancestors many years ago that when the rains are blood red, the House of Usher will crumble to the earth. There are three members of the Usher family living, two in direct descent, the Lady Madeline and her twin brother, Roderick. I was engaged to marry Roderick long before I knew my cousin. It is the custom for the Usher family to intermarry. The Lady Madeline has been confined to bed these many weeks, waiting for death waiting for the last days of her life to pass quietly. I have so little time left, Roderick. I must see Charles before I die. Charles Wilson is tied up in London on business. He can't come down here every time you've a whim to see him. This is no whim. It's just a matter of days before I... Don't be impatient with me. Sister, please. Oh, afraid of the truth, Roderick? You've always been afraid of me. I can read your mind so easily. Look at me, brother. Let's not argue again. You've always wanted me to die. You've waited for it year after year, praying and hoping that I die, leaving you free to inherit the house and the fortune. But you'll be fooled. Look. Look at the rain. This isn't you speaking, it's the fever. Fever or not, the rain is turning red, isn't it? Yes, it, it seems that way at times. Each day it will be redder and redder and darker and... Madeline. Afraid, brother? Are you afraid of blood-red rains? The doctor said you should have rest and quiet. You, you weaken yourself when you're excited. Where's Dina? I don't know, I'm not her keeper. She's downstairs, probably, buried in that romantic nonsense that she reads. Every girl likes to read romantic stories, Rod. Heaven help her when she becomes your wife. Call her for me, will you? The doctor's orders were that you're not to be disturbed. Call her, Rod. Do as I say. For your own good, I... I'll get even with you someday. Dina? 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 Madeline? Dina? Did you call me Lady Madeline? Yes, Dina Child. Come here, my dear. Is there something I can do for you? Yes. I want to see Charles Wilson before... before I die. I told you he was busy, Maddie. Tell Talbot to hitch up the coach in four, Dina. Go to London tonight. Tell Charles I must see him right away. Bring him back with you. I'll not have Dina go out in this weather. But, Rod, Dina, please go. Don't listen to Rod. Do this for me. I will not have strangers dragged into our family secrets. Charles Wilson is no stranger. He's the only one who knows the secret of the house of Usher. I don't like leaving you, cousin. The doctor will be here shortly. Hurry, my dear, and bring Charles back. I forbid it, Dina. If I don't see Charles tonight, I'll be buried alive. Not able to live. Not able to die. <laughs> Yeah, we'll never get through to London tonight, Mum. Not in this weather. Not in a million years. It ain't a night for humans to be a bat. The Lady Madeline is dying. The least we can do is grant her her last wish. Nina! Nina! Quickly, Talbot, before Lord Rick tries to catch up with us. Nina, did you hear me call you? Yes, I heard you, cousin. 
try to protect you, child, because I love you. I don't want any harm to come to my future wife. Please, Ryan. Why do you turn from me when I touch you? I don't know. Afraid of me? I... I... Answer me, Dina. Are you afraid of me? Yes. But you loved me once. That was before we returned to the house of Osha. And you're going anyway? Yes, Roderick. For Madeline's sake. Are you ready, Mum? Yes. Yes, Talbot, ready. We'll be back by midnight, Roderick. Hurry, cousin. Or else the lady Madeline might not live long enough to get her last wish. Did she leave, Roderick? Yes. Madeline, why don't you confide in me? Why must you call in strangers when you know how it humiliates me? I can't trust you, Roderick. Ever since we were children, you've kept one secret from me. What is that secret, Madeline? <laughs> That's one thing you never read aloud of me. What is that secret, Maddie? Leave me alone, brother. I'm ill. You're dying, Madeline. You know you're dying. A secret won't do you any good. Now, what is it? Please, Roderick. Tell me, Madeline, or you won't live to die the way you think you will. Oh, have pity. Tell me, or by heaven, I'll force it out of you. Oh, oh. oh whoa there, whoa, boy. Yeah, whoa. Yeah, this is his house, Mum. Thank you, Talbot. Mr. Wilson, is he here? Yes, sir. Why, Dina Asher, what are you doing in London at this hour of the night? Come in, my dear. The Lady Madeline sent me. Great heavens, child, your clothes are drenched. Come on in. I'll fix you some hot tea. Oh, we haven't time, Charles. Madeline wants to see you at once. Please come with me right away. The doctor doesn't think she'll live through the night. Madeline? Dying? Oh, she's been ill for months. Charles, you wouldn't know her anymore. Why didn't you let me know before this? Roderick wouldn't let me. Roderick? But why? I can't explain now, Charles. Believe me when I say it's important that you come at once. Talbot's waiting outside. I'm frightened for Madeline. We've got to be back by midnight. <laughs> You came in time, Doctor. Lady Usher, you shouldn't allow your brother to excite you. There's a cruel streak in him at times. Surprisingly like my grandfather. What time is it? Midnight. Here, drink this. It will give you strength. Oh, I can't move. Uh, lean against me. There. <laughs> Dr. Bain, you've attended all my family, haven't you? Yes, Lady Usher. You've been closer to us than almost anyone. If I ask you for an honest answer, would you give it to me? That depends on the question. How much longer have I to live? Years, my dear. No, Doctor. I want an honest answer, please. It's imperative that I know... I don't know, really, my dear. Hurry, Talbot. Please hurry. I'm going as fast as the horses can go, Mum. Get up. Faster, Talbot. We won't accomplish anything at all if you lose self-control, Dina. Oh, I'm sorry, Charles, but I've the most dreadful foreboding. Foreboding? Well, I thought Madeline and Roderick were as close as brother and sister could possibly be. They were until about a year ago. What caused the change? Well, I'd been living at the house of Usher for about four months when Roderick suddenly became, well, nervous, jumpy. He'd lock himself up in his room for days. He was morbid, frightfully morbid. Sounds like a depression of spirit. Oh, it went deeper than that. Madeline fell ill at the same time. And then... The horrible reddish rains began to fall. Red rain? Dina, really? Oh, you'll see. The first day those rains began to fall, the rift between Mad and Roderick widened. Until now, their hate is a living thing. It fills the house. They seem to be battling constantly for possession of each other's soul. Charles, look. Look ahead. There's the house. And the rain. 
look at the rain. Yes. Red rain. Well, Charles, uh, do come in. We, we've been waiting for you. Oh, it's good to see you again, Roderick. Come in, Dina. Don't stand there staring at me. It's been a long time since I've last seen you, Rod. Yes, sir. Uh, a long time. Let me take your coat, Charles. I'll hang it up. Thank you, dear. My sister's waiting, Charles. You'd better go right up. Yes, uh, of course. I'd better warn you. Madeline's delirious. She doesn't quite know what she's saying sometime. Uh, Rod, uh... Why don't you come up with me? She expressed a desire to see you alone. Charles. Oh, Charles, I'm so glad you came. I had to see you alone. Madeline, don't try to sit up. You'll only weaken yourself. Sit over here, Charles, next to me. You're the only person I can trust, and you must promise to do exactly as I say. Of course, of course. Remember what I told you years ago. Remember about Roderick and me. I told you then that he and I were more than twins. Well, that was just childish fancy. Oh, I wish to God it were. But those suspicions have all been proven these last few months. Roderick and I are, are only one person. Not two. We have two earthly bodies. But we share one soul. When Charles and I were born, our shoulders were attached. The day of our birth, we were separated. Well, that doesn't necessarily mean you share one soul. I've never been able to feel anything for myself. His thoughts are my thoughts. His tears are my tears. His weaknesses are mine. Don't you understand, Charles? Are you sure of this, Madeline? Positive. His mind has the initiative. He doesn't respond to my emotions. Because I had none. None. I'm cold without him. Don't you see? My earthly body is wasting away. But my soul is not my own. As long as he's alive, Charles, the power of his life will keep me living. Madeline, Lady Madeline, you mustn't even think of it. Oh, it's true, though. I'll have a living death. I'll be buried alive. Unable to live. Unable to die. Madeline. That's why I called you here. Promise me now, Charles. You'll never allow my coffin to be sealed. Keep my body in this house. You must rest, Madeline. Stop talking. Do you death. promise, Charles? Promise. Yes, yes, of course I do. Don't, don't tell Roderick, Charles. Ever. He'll seal me in my tomb alive. Madeline, my, my dear. Every model is entitled to his own soul. If I can't rest in death... Oh, if I can't rest in death... I'll return from the grave and take him with me. My promise is my word. What are you doing standing outside this door, Roderick? Tina. Mad enough to see Charles in privacy. Why do you insist on spying on your own sister? Shut up. I can't understand you, Roderick. There are many things you can't understand, Tina. Come with me downstairs. Let me go. Come along. It's the living room. I'd like to go in and tell Madeline that you were spying on her again. Tell her if you wish. She's a poor, sick thing. Unable to lift her arm against me. I don't know how I ever loved you. You'll learn to again after we're married. I hate you, Roderick Usher. I'll never marry you. I... I... In heaven's name! Roderick! Roderick, what's the matter? Pain inside me, crawling like bourbon. I... Help me, Dina. Oh, of course. Help me. Roderick! <laughs> Dina! It's Madeline! She's dead! <sighs> Here I am, Madeline, beside your bed. You're dead, Madeline. Dead. Two people fought for the possession of one soul, and you've lost. <laughs> You'll try to drag me to the grave with you, but you're weaker than I, Madeline. You'll never return. Never. And that was her last request, Doctor. It's a peculiar request, Mr. Wilson. I know it is, Doctor, but it was the Lady Madeline's last wish. Oh, Roderick. What are you doing here? 
taking a last look at my beloved sister's face. Oh. Doctor, I'm not quite sure that the Lady Madeline is dead. Look at the flush of life in her cheeks. Stop speaking like a fool, Charles. Look for yourself, Roderick. What are you trying to do, frighten me? No. I've asked the doctor to verify her death. In cases of this kind, Mr. Wilson, death from catalepsy, the deceased often retains a lifelike flush. But it's merely symptomatic. Nothing supernatural about it. Of course she's dead. Isn't she, Doctor? However, if you feel the slightest doubt... No doubt at all. I'd suggest delaying the burial for a week or two. As the nearest of kin, I want the funeral held at once. She'll be laid to rest in the family catacombs beneath the house. Roderick, I gave her my word. Your word isn't valid. You're not one of the family. But it was my word of honor. Don't make some family affairs, Charles. But the least you can do is grant her last wish, Roderick. This is nonsense. The dead are best buried. But, Rod, your own sister... No. As the doctor in the case, I don't feel justified in making out a death certificate for two weeks. The Lady Madeline will lie in state in her coffin in the catacombs. The coffin will remain open. For 30 years, these catacombs have been unused. Look at the walls, Dina. Time has encrusted them with nitre. It's cold in here. Cold and damp. Let's take the coffin this way, Talbot. Watch out, Charles. Don't fall. Be careful. Catacombs have always been soft with slime and nitre. Hard to breathe in here at times, isn't it? Where's the room, Roderick? Ahead. At the end of the corridor. Are you positive we can keep a fire burning in there? Yes, Charles. Uh, Talbot. Yes, sir. Did you start the fire? Oh, yes, sir. I did that early this morning. The room ought to be warm by now, sir. Talbot's a dependable man. He starts warm fires to bring life to death. Roderick, how can you act like that? Your own sister. Yes, my own dear, beloved sister. Hey, Charles, look ahead of you. Tiny room at the end of a corridor. The fire is blazing. Careful. Careful with the casket. We'll place it on the table. Center. All right, sir. We can place it down. Yes, Yes, Tom. Down there. I know that my redeemer will rest in peace. And that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though this body be destroyed, yet shall I see God, whom I shall see for myself, and mine eyes shall behold, and not as a stranger. We brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. The Lord giveth, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Talbot! Talbot! Yes, ma'am? Why, Mum, what are you doing up at this hour of the night? I can't sleep. I keep dreaming the Lady Madeline is crying for help. Where's Lord Roderick? Well, he couldn't sleep either, Mum. He said he was worried that his sister was cold, Mum. Whatever does he mean by that? Did he go down to the catacombs? Yes, Mum, that he did. He said he wanted to stir the fires a bit. Down there? Hey, oh, wait a minute, Mum. Later, Talbot. I must stop him. I must. I wouldn't go down there, Mum. It's ever so cold at night and damp. I wouldn't go down there myself. I advise Lord Roderick against it, Mum. I did. I told Roderick. 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 The door. The door slammed shut. It's so dark in here. Cold and dark. Roderick. Roderick. Roderick, where are you? Rod. Rod, answer me. Rod. Roderick. Roderick, I can't see. I don't like these goings on at all, I don't. People dying and not getting themselves properly buried. It ain't normal. No, that it ain't. Albert. What? Are you out too, Mr. Wilson? Don't nobody sleep proper in this here house? Where are Miss Dina and Lord Roderick Talbot? Well, I was sitting here as nice as you please, sir. But where is Miss Dina Talbot? Well, yeah, that's what I'm getting to. I was drinking this here cup of tea when Lord Roderick comes in a little past midnight. Or uh, was it a little before midnight? Where is he? Well, well, I'm getting to that. He comes in and he says he does... He wants a flame. Yes? Yeah. 
He says, as calm as you please. He wants to go down and keep his sister from getting cold. And Miss Dana? Well, as for her, she came down a little later and said she dreamt that the Lady Madeline was calling to her. So she follows Lord Roderick to the catacombs. It ain't proper, sir. It ain't proper. There's the light. There. Are you calling me, cousin? Oh, Roderick. Roderick, I was so frightened. I thought I was lost. Why did you come down here? I, I dreamt Madeline needed me. Well, what did you do, Rod? Be quiet, Tina. You closed the coffin. Oh, how could you? Don't you approve? You, you were going to drive a, a stake through her coffin. She was a witch, Tina. A witch. Isn't that the custom to drive a stake through the heart of a witch? Watch, Dina. Watch. No. Watch me drive the hammer through a heart. What? Stop, Rod. Don't. Stop that. What? Roderick, put that stake down ah. in heaven's name. Don't. Don't. Leave it alone. Take your hands off me. Oh, please, Roderick. Please. It's so horrible. Ah. Don't you understand? It's your own sister. Your own sister. You'll pay for this, Dina. You and Madeline together. Oh, Roderick. Calvin, help me with him. Yes, sir. Pardon me, Lord Roderick, but... Oh, Oh, Charles, darling. You came just in time. He looks like he was dead, sir. Lying there on the sofa. No. No, he's beginning to stir. Keep bathing his face in cool water, dear. Uh, He'll be all right. I'm afraid the shock of Madeline's death is too much for him. The shock of her death, uh, the constant fall of the rain. It's getting redder all the time, Charles. Uh, yes, it is. That's just an electric phenomenon. Oh, Don't try to move, Roderick. Oh, It's you, Dina. You again. Lie still, cousin. You'll feel better in a little while. You're both fools. You shouldn't have stopped me. She's a witch. Don't you understand? No, no, Roderick. Listen. Listen, Charles. What? Can't you hear it? What are you talking about? Listen. I told you once my hearing was super acute. I can hear a heart beating. You're over, Rod. Suppose I go for the doctor, Rod. He'll give you a sedative. No. No, don't leave me. But you need your sleep. Of course you do. All this horror tonight will pass over when the morning comes. And those infernal rains clear. It's not in my mind. She's coming. She's coming for me. Can hear her in the catacombs. Listen, Charles, listen. Roderick, please believe me that you're simply overwrought and emotional. I've got to get out of here. I must leave at once. She's coming for me. Coming. She swore she would. I know she did. I overheard. I overheard her talk with you, Charles. Roderick. Cousin, no, you're hearing things. Now, listen. I can't hear anything. She's leaving the catacombs now. Listen, Charles, don't you hear her breathing? Can't you hear her footsteps? Her sighs? She's in the hallway, Charles. In the hall. Help me, Charles. Help me, Charles. Roderick. She's coming closer. Faster. Faster. Her feet are on the stairs. One by one, she's coming up those stairs. Listen, you can hear her now, can't you? You can hear her now. Charles, look out the window. The rains are blood red. She's outside the door. Listen. Listen, cousin, listen. Madeline! No, sister. Leave the house of Usher, Charles. You and Dina, leave this cursed house at once. The rains are blood red, and I've come to reclaim my soul. Adler. Oh! And you, Roderick, you will be soulless forever. From that chamber and from that mansion, Charles and I fled aghast. The storm was still abroad in all its wrath as we crossed the park to the highway. The moon above the house of Usher was blood red. And Charles held me close as we walked on and on into the night. Dina, my darling. Don't look back. The house has crumbled to the ground. Crumbled into the cavernous tide. Charles. Little Dina. 
You'll always be safe with me. From the time-worn pages of the past, we have recalled the fall of the House of Usher. Bellkeeper, toll the bell. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media, hear other podcasts that I host, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. In the early 1900s, germ theory was a relatively new concept, and many, including doctors, were unaware of how diseases spread. At the time, bacterial diseases like typhoid and dysentery could still wipe out an entire family. Mary Mallon was an Irish immigrant who worked as a cook for affluent New York families. In her wake, she unknowingly left an outburst of typhoid fever, earning her the epithet typhoid Mary. By that time, doctors knew the disease was most commonly spread through excrement, and they were able to trace outbreaks by locating the start of an epidemic and following its spread. By the time of her first quarantine in 1907, doctors determined that Malin had infected 22 people and caused the death of a little girl. When she was permanently quarantined in 1915, she had ultimately infected an estimated 51 people, at least three of whom died from the disease. Since no healthy carriers had yet been identified, Mallon refused to believe that she, a healthy, middle-aged woman, could possibly be the culprit behind the disease's spread. Eventually, public health officials in New York traced the outbreaks to the outwardly healthy Mallon, who landed herself in quarantine for life on North Brother Island after numerous fights and blatant refusals. We'll learn a little bit more about North Brother Island later on. In an almost decade-long battle that struck fear into many city dwellers' hearts, the legendary lady played a game of disease-riddled cat and mouse with New York's Public Health Division. When Dr. George Soper, the sanitary engineer who identified Malin as the typhoid culprit, came to take samples in 1907, Mallon outright refused. Allegedly, the cook grabbed a meat cleaver, alternatively a rolling pin or meat fork depending on the story you hear, and chased him out of her house. After several more attempts, authorities were able to pin down Mary. The last attempt ended in a three-hour chase. After considerable resistance, 
Mary Mallon was finally taken into custody for stool, urine, and tissue samples. Doctors then confirmed she was indeed ripe with the typhoid bacteria, despite the fact she displayed zero symptoms and remained the epitome of good health. Public health officials deemed her a threat to society and decided she must be quarantined. Against her will, Mallon was placed in a single occupancy cottage at the Riverside Hospital for Communicable Diseases on North Brother Island. Mallon stated to reporters she felt that she was being grossly mistreated, like a leper, and continuously insisted there was no way she had typhoid. By 1915, the now infamous Typhoid Mary had been recaptured and placed under a lifelong quarantine back at North Brother Island. Perhaps it was her intransigence or the fact that doctors truly didn't know how to handle a case like hers, but the health authorities treated Mallon inhumanely. When she was first tested, doctors discovered her gallbladder was riddled with the salmonella bacteria and they wanted to remove it. She refused the procedure during her first quarantine, but when they had Mallon in her second custody, they made a second attempt. She managed to prevent the surgery, but she couldn't prevent the doctors from taking over 160 samples from her body during her remaining years there. She also suffered neglect at the quarantine facility. Mallon was shown off to interns and journalists as a specimen. Her doctors limited her interactions greatly, only allowing her to wash bottles in the laboratory. Throughout the ordeal, Mallon repeatedly denied she was a carrier of typhoid in all the outbreaks that followed her career. However, she left quietly after each family's disease outbreak and always changed her name slightly for each new job. While she obviously wanted to avoid association with the press and she would want to remain in a typhoid-stricken household, Mallon's strange behavior makes some critics wonder if she did actually understand she was somehow a carrier of the disease. Mallon was released from her first quarantine under the condition that she would not continue working as a cook. In 1910, she was released and began a job as a laundress. Mallon promptly disappeared from her washing position, however, and immediately began to serve families again. For five years, she managed to evade the authorities by constantly changing her name and regularly changing jobs. In 1915, an outbreak of 25 new typhoid cases occurred at Sloan Maternity Hospital in New York. Mallon was found working as a cook there, and she was promptly arrested and returned to quarantine. Mallon was returned to North Brother Island in 1915, and New York public health officials decided she would remain under quarantine for the rest of her life. The newly dubbed Typhoid Mary had been called the most dangerous woman in America, and authorities agreed she could not be trusted to follow any sort of prevention in spreading typhoid. For her remaining 23 years of life, Mallon lived mostly in isolation on North Brother Island. In 1938, she supposedly died from pneumonia though reports vary. By the time of her death, estimates contested that she had caused at least 51 cases of typhoid and three deaths. Health officials didn't expect to encounter typhoid in wealthy, upper-middle-class families in New York, as it was typically associated with poverty and poor hygiene. Upon her first questionings from New York City health officials in 1907, Mallon admitted that she didn't see the point in washing her hands. Germ theory was still fairly new, and she didn't seem to believe sickness could be transferred through physical contact or lack of proper washing. In 1906, George Soper, a sanitary engineer for the New York Department of Health, was hired by a homeowner whose family had suffered a violent and inexplicable typhoid outbreak. His first instinct was to look to the servants and cooks. Specifically, he was curious about an Irish immigrant who had been hired as a cook for the family three weeks before the outbreak, the exact incubation period of the salmonella bacteria that causes typhoid. He conducted a background check on her work history and saw the trail of typhoid victims. Coupled with the culprit's rapid job and name changes, Soper knew he had found his carrier. Soper interviewed Mallon and eventually suggested that she could be the carrier causing the outbreaks. Mallon staunchly denied his accusations. Authorities became involved before Mallon could be restrained and formally tested for the bacteria. 
Malin was the first identified asymptomatic carrier of typhoid, meaning she carried the disease without displaying any of the symptoms. This was a breakthrough discovery at the time, but unfortunately no protocol existed to address such a problem. Health authorities did have the right to quarantine people who posed a risk to society health-wise. However, even though authorities knew Mellon was somehow the missing link in the typhoid outbreaks, they couldn't exactly prove how or why. Mellon's anger and claims of a government conspiracy only worsened the already fraught situation. At certain times, the public even sided with Mary Mallon. However, she was undoubtedly the carrier, as her compiled work history left a path of repeated sickness and death in its wake. Only in 2013 did Stanford researchers make a breakthrough in which they discovered how Mallon was able to carry the bacteria yet not display symptoms. Simply explained, the salmonella bacteria behind typhoid can hide in immune cells known as macrophages and essentially hijack their metabolism in their favor. If the germs are successful in hacking the macrophages, then the person, in this case Mary Mallon, can spread the germ unknowingly while remaining healthy themselves. Mallon's discovery in 1906 as the first asymptomatic carrier in the country made waves in the scientific community. By the time of Mallon's death in 1938, over 400 other healthy carriers had been identified. According to records, it appears not one of them received forced confinement like Typhoid Mary, though. This raised questions about epidemic and public health protocol. Many questioned whether it was justifiable to confine someone against their will for the greater good of society. The medical community contested that Mallon's refusal to cooperate or act honestly regarding her diagnosis warranted her rough treatment and confinement. In the early 1900s, typhoid was still a fairly dangerous disease. The mortality rate was about 10 percent. A doctor introduced the first vaccine in 1896, which helped considerably for soldiers who were more likely to die from typhoid than combat, but it hadn't quite become widespread enough to be entirely effective for the masses. Typhoid sufferers start exhibiting symptoms between one and three weeks after infection usually starting with a dangerously high fever along with nausea, vomiting, headaches, and muscle pain. Next, a distinctive rash appears on the chest. Without treatment, intestinal bleeding can occur, leading to blood clots under the skin. In the most dangerous cases, the abdomen will distend. While Typhoid Mary lived the last two decades of her life involuntarily on New York's North Brother Island, it's believed she may still be living there in spectral form. We'll talk about North Brother Island when Weird Darkness returns. Sometimes you feel a bit nutty, especially if you're a weirdo. If that feeling transfers to your taste buds as well, I've got some great news for you. Weird Dark Roast Nutty Mummy Coffee. Wrap your taste buds around this medium dark roast blend with shrouds of almond, honey, and chocolate. Each bag of Nutty Mummy is exclusive to Weird Darkness and is roasted to order, then bandaged, I mean bagged, specifically for you to ensure maximum freshness for you, your mummy, and anyone else you share it with. Entomb your old coffee and bring your taste buds back from the dead with Weird Dark Roast Nutty Mummy at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Wait a minute. Have you heard the whistler? I'm the Whistler. If you could look upon Charlie as I do, you'd realize he's inanimate, dead, with no power to harm. That was old Peter Medford, the jungle explorer. 
Now confined to a wheelchair with paralysis. I would suggest that you leave this place at once, Miss Medford. At once. That was Clay Alden, Peter Medford's secretary. And this is Marie, Peter Medford's young niece. No, no, no. It's no dream. It's here. Here in my room. Saturday night, and CBS presents another in the new mystery series, The Whistler. And I, the whistler, know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales, many secrets, hidden in the hearts of men and women who've stepped into the shadows. I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. And so I tell you tonight the strange mystery of the shrunken head. In the quickening darkness of a stormy fall evening, a young girl paces the deserted platform of a small suburban railroad station. From her anxious attitude, we know that she's waiting for someone. But just be patient, Miss Medford. There is someone coming to meet you. (laughs) He has just now driven up. He's coming through the station door, walking up behind you. Miss Medford? Oh, oh, yes, I... Sorry to have kept you waiting. I'm Clay Alden. Oh, yes. Uncle Peter has mentioned you in his letters. Uh, his secretary, aren't you? That's right. Where is my uncle? He was disappointed he couldn't meet you. Pretty much of a task for the old gentleman to get around these days. You see, he's confined to a wheelchair. Oh, I didn't know. Serious? Legs are paralyzed. Result of jungle fever. Just came on him lately. How awful. Yes, it's a shame, all right. Well, shall we get going? Car's out front. Better run for it or you'll get wet. Yes, I'll take care of your luggage. Thank you very much. Rather a disappointing reception, Marie Medford, wouldn't you think? You have come over 2,000 miles all by yourself just to see the only living relative you have in the world. And then you are met by a stranger. The car turns up the tree-lined driveway. This Marie is what is known in this countryside as Medford Manor. Yes, Medford Manor. It's all that the name implies. A gloomy pile of a structure, even made gloomier by the blackness of the night and the driving rain. Oh, someone has heard the car approach. The door is open. It's the butler, Victor. Well, Marie... Are you going in? (laughs) What a pity you don't know what I do. You'd never cross that threshold if you did. Hmm. Too late now. Your luggage is being brought in. The young man and the butler stand beside you. The door closes. Victor? Yes? Take Miss Medford's luggage upstairs to the south corner bedroom. The, The south corner bedroom, sir? Certainly. Why not? Very good, sir. Um, Any further instructions? No. Oh, uh, has Mr. Medford retired yet? Uh, Not yet, sir. He's in his study. I I just gave him his... uh, his warm milk. He may have dozed off, sir. All right. Thank you, Victor. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Would you care to follow Victor to your room, Miss Medford? I'd like to see my uncle now, if I could, please. Very well. Come this way. Here we are. I'll speak to him. Wait here, please. Well, Marie, how do you like it? You get a feeling of something not as it should be? (laughs) Strange fellow, this Clay. And the butler, too. Uh, Look about you. What a depressing house. Huge and cold and unfriendly. Oh, Not at all as you'd imagined it. (laughs) Is it, Marie? Your uncle will see you now. Thank you. Marie, my dear child, come in, come in, come in. Uncle. Well, well, my poor child, take off those wet things at once. Alden, what's the matter with you? My niece will catch her death. Help her off with those things. Sorry, Mr. Medford. Thank you. Bless my soul, pretty as the picture. You got a kiss for us? Of course. (laughs) That's it. Now you sit down here beside me. 
I'm, I'm sorry I couldn't meet you, my dear, but I, I'm afraid the ravages of old age and malaria have finally caught up with me. My one comfort is this wheelchair. <laughs> Getting on to it, though, you should see me wheeling all over the house. <laughs> the only thing that baffles me is the stairs. My life is now confined to the first floor only. Oh, pretty bad trip, wasn't it? Seemed endless. Well, you're here now, thank goodness. This is your home. You're free to come and go and do whatever you please. Thank you, Uncle Peter. Don't suppose any of this is what you imagined? I know that I'm different from what I'd hoped you'd find. <laughs> Tell me, Uncle Peter, do you think you'd have recognized me if you hadn't known I was coming? Recognize you? Why, of course. You have the family of Medford written all over you. Oh. No mistaking you, my dear. Well, Alden, what are you standing there for? What are you staring at? Oh. Waiting to see if you need anything for this. No, 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 that's all. I'll ring for you if I need you. Yes, sir. Oh, I forgot to thank him. For what? He gets paid for whatever he does? Forgive me for saying this, but somehow I don't like that young man. Was he rude to you? Oh, no, not actually. But he seems to resent my being here. And the butler, he seems resentful, too. I feel as though I don't belong. Oh, they're harmless enough. But getting back to you... I I was so sorry I was in South America at the time the time it happened. Must have been pretty ghastly for you, my child. Like a nightmare, Uncle Peter. I'm not myself yet. I should think not. An only child losing both parents so suddenly and and so horribly. Maybe it was a good thing it was sudden. It had to happen at all. One spectator at the crash said that they never never knew what happened. Now, 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 you mustn't talk about it. All that's behind you, a new life from now on. Hmm? Of course. And that's the way I want to look at it, Uncle Peter. And I'd like to get something to do. What? Oh, now. Oh, yes, you... really, I would. I want to be active if I can. I'm quite capable. I'd really like to get a, a job, Uncle Peter. Well, bless my soul. Secretarial work or anything. Well, that, that might not be a bad idea. It'll keep you from brooding. We'll see what we can do. And now, now I have a little surprise for you. You haven't seen my collection. No, I haven't. Mother and father often talked about it. Well, if you'll just open that door over there, I'll show some of it to you. Oh, this one? That's right. Uh, you'll find the light switch just inside. Why? Why, it's a regular museum. All these glass cases. Over here, my dear. Now, look at these. Well, what do you think of them? Well, they're horrible, Uncle Peter. They look like, like tiny human heads. Well, that's exactly what they are. Life-size at one time, but isn't it remarkable the way they shrink them down? Look at this one. See his little features, perfect in every detail. He's my favorite. Interesting history about him. He was once a white man. Oh. Forced down in a South American jungle when his plane cracked up. The headhunters got hold of him, and there he is. His name is Charlie. I'd like to see him closer. I can unlock the case. No, no, please. Do you mind if I don't look anymore? Oh, dear. I, I keep forgetting people are sometimes shocked by these things. I see them only through a collector's eyes. Oh, well, you'll have lots of time to look over my jungle paraphernalia. I Meanwhile, perhaps you'd better get some rest. Would you like Victor to get you something to eat? No, thank you, Uncle Peter. But I am rather tired. I, I think I'll say good night to you. Know your way about, do you? Yes, I'll, I'll find my room. Good night, Uncle Peter. Good night, my sweet child. I'll see you in the morning. <laughs> Poor Marie. Know something? You're going to have dreams tonight. Unpleasant ones, too. <laughs> Well, let's move the clock ahead and go to Marie's bedroom. It's a little after three in the morning. She's asleep now. The rain's still coming down. The wind moans outside. Hear it? Yes, Marie's asleep. Looks peaceful enough lying there in that big four-poster bed. But suddenly she begins to toss. Mm. Oh, my name's Charlie. Mm. My name's Charlie. My name's Charlie. My name's Charlie. No, no, no. Uncle Peter! Oh. Oh, how foolish. Only a 
dream. But it seems so real. I'm sure I heard it whisper. My name's Charlie. Only the wind. Oh, I wish I hadn't seen that dreadful thing. Miss Medford, are you all right? Who's there? Clay Alden. Oh. Oh, yes, Mr. Alden. I, uh... I just had a bad dream, that's all. I'm quite all right, thank you. Well, if you need anything, just ring. Yes, I will. Sorry I disturbed you. Not at all. Oh, I... I must get some sleep. Stop dreaming. But little sleep for you, Marie. (laughs) The moments tick by with dreadful slowness. Fearing to close her eyes, she lies staring at the roof of her bed, lying in agony for the moment when that hideous little head will again come floating in through space. It is morning now. A dreary fog still hovers depressingly over the old house. A cold clamminess which only adds to Marie's sensation of uneasiness. In the dismal morning room, Victor is serving breakfast to Clay Alden and Marie. Shame you didn't rest well last night, Miss Medford. Oh, just the newness of everything. I'll get used to it, Victor. I hope you will, Miss. Of course you will. Oh, and Mr. Alden, um, don't mention anything to my uncle about that silly dream I had last night. Oh, of course not. Did you have a bad night, miss? Yes. The daytime makes such a difference in things. Even you seem different, Mr. Alden. For the better, I trust. Oh, sorry. That wasn't very complimentary. Oh, here comes Uncle. Well, good morning, you two. Good morning, Mr. Medford. Morning, Uncle Peter. You look quite fit this morning, sir. Feeling splendidly. Had the best night's sleep in I don't know how long. And how are you feeling, my child? Quite well, thank you, Uncle. Oh, uh, you remember our conversation of last evening? I mean, about you wanting to do something? Yes. I think I've got it for you. A friend of mine named Phineas Drake collects books, just purchased a library complete, wants someone to catalog it for him. Small pay, but not too difficult. Well, how does it sound? Oh, it sounds wonderful. It's just what I want. <laughs> Splendid. I'll call him again after breakfast. Can you imagine such an ambitious young girl, Alden? Wants to work, and she's only worth a cool million. Oh, not yet. I'm not, Uncle Peter. Well, whenever you become of age, or whatever it said in your father's will. I thought you knew what it said. I won't inherit my cool million until I'm married. What was that, Miss Medford? You see? Right away you put notions into his head. She said she won't come into her inheritance until she marries. Why her father made that strange provision, I shall never know. But, Marie, you stay your distance from this young man. Oh, Uncle Peter, you're making him embarrassed. (laughs) Can't an old man have his little joke? Anyway, with all the eligible young men you'll meet, poor Alden won't stand a chance. Oh, Peter, please. (laughs) All right, all right, all right. Victor, Uh, where are my eggs? Right here, sir. Oh, yes, soft-boiled eggs. That's your diet. (sighs) Tell me, my dear. Did you find your room comfortable? Oh, yes, it's a lovely room. It's almost like a castle. Oh, I miss my old room. The one next to yours. I haven't been up there in over a month. One day soon, I'll have Victor and Alden carry me up those stairs just to see if the place looks the same. Victor, serve my niece some more coffee. Yes. Yes, of course, sir. Oh, Marie, you're going to have something to do, eh? Well, you're an intelligent girl. Should do well at your new assignment. It's harder work than you thought, though. Hours of scanning small print and copying down the individual histories of countless books. All goes well for several weeks. And then early one afternoon, you return home, Marie, to find your uncle as usual in his study. Why are you so upset, Marie? <laughs> uncle Peter. Marie. Well, you're home early. You're not finished already. Finished as far as Mr. Phineas Drake is concerned. I, I can't understand it. I've done my work well. This afternoon, Mr. Drake came to me and said he had no further use for my services. What? Didn't explain why, just... 
just looked at me queerly and said he preferred someone else to finish the job. Well, that's strange. Oh, well, he's an old crank. Don't let this upset you. We'll find something else for you to do. No, 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 no. Don't you worry. <laughs> with my work, Mr. Palanto. Surely it's been satisfactory. Well, you see, because of the uh, peculiar nature of my profession, I, I must have someone more experienced. Uh, I'm sorry, Miss Medford. But I didn't, Professor Handy. I did exactly as you instructed. What on earth is wrong? <clears throat> uh, you'll excuse me, Miss Medford, but... Uh... Well, your ability as an assistant has not come up to standard. Please listen, Dr. Humphrey. I've studied botany, and I've checked this manuscript most carefully. There's not a single mistake. Very sorry, Miss Medford, but they're not all acceptable. Have to get someone else. I can't understand it, Uncle Peter. Is there something wrong with me? Well, I, I shall certainly call Dr. Humphrey right away. Oh, no. No, I'd rather you didn't. But it was only the other day he telephoned me and said, what an efficient secretary I thought you were. Something wrong somewhere. Ah, uh, you, you know, Marie, I, I think I'd give up this idea of wanting to work. I haven't mentioned it to you, but you're really not looking your best lately. Well, to tell the truth, Uncle, I, I haven't been sleeping well. I have the most frightening nightmares. In fact, it's the same dream every night. Well, that's odd. What's the dream about? Well, I, uh... I keep seeing that little head. The one you said was called Charlie. Oh, dear. I I suppose I made a mistake showing that to you on your first night. If you could only look upon Charlie as I do, you'd realize it is an animate dead with no power at all to do you harm. You build up a phobia about that head. Now, the thing to do is to destroy that fear by facing it. You come along with me, my dear. You mean in there again? It's the only way. Now, come along. Oh, no, Uncle Peter. I know what I'm doing. Open that door, Marie. I'm going to make you realize how foolish you've been. Over here, my dear. Oh, I know you think I'm being cruel, but I know my psychology. I... Why, that's strange. What is it, Uncle Peter? Why, somebody's broken into this case. Ring for Victor and get Alden here at once. Is something missing? Somebody has deliberately taken that head. <laughs> so Charlie is missing, eh? Wonder who could have broken the lock and lifted the little head from its black velvet pad. <laughs> I wonder. <laughs> but now, several nights have passed. And still the head called Charlie has not reappeared. Marie has just taken a sedative her Uncle Peter gave her and is now lying on her bed, tossing, fretfully, praying for sleep. <laughs> sleep, Marie. Tonight? Oh, dear heaven. No dreams tonight. Let me get some sleep. My name's Charlie. No. My name's Charlie. No. My name's Charlie. No. Yes, Marie. Open your eyes. Asleep. Well, oh, you're frightened out of your wits. Another of those dreams? It was no dream this time. The head. It's there in my room. What? It told me to open my eyes and look at it. And, and there it was in my hand. I was I was so frightened I, I threw it to the floor. Oh, I know dreams can seem terribly oh, real, this but. It was no dream, I tell you. It's there now in my room. When I threw it on the floor, it rolled to the foot of my bed. Oh, don't look at me as though I'm insane. Come look for yourself if you don't believe me. Just as you say. It's right here. I'll turn on this lamp here. Now it... My God. It was here. It was. I saw it as plainly as I can see you. Oh, I know you think I'm crazy. But I saw it. 
I saw it. I tell you, I saw Miss it. Miss Medford, please. What's wrong, Miss Medford? I thought I heard you scream. It's your uncle. Are you all right? I'm coming down, Uncle Peter. I must talk to you. Now, 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 you must get hold of yourself, my dear. Oh, you won't think I'm crazy. But I really did see it. I touched it. And it was, it was nestled like an... Like an orange in my hand. I woke up and, and threw it on the floor. And when Mr. Alden and I came back to the room, it was gone. Oh, you don't believe I actually saw it. Do you? Now, now, now compose yourself, child. I want to ask you some questions. First of all, in this dream, do you hear a voice of any kind? Yes. yes. A voice that whispers, my name's Charlie, over and over. But tonight it, it said something different. Now, you needn't go on, my dear. I had hoped and prayed with all my heart that this wouldn't happen to you. But I'm afraid it has. What are you trying to tell me, Uncle Pete? You've heard me go on about the fine old Medford stock. Well, it so happens our branch isn't so fine. There's been something wrong with us. You mean... Insanity? Oh! But if there is insanity in the family... Why haven't I heard of it before? Because, my dear, it's... It's the Medford secret. Oh. Oh, Peter. I'm frightened. Whatever you do, Marie, you must not let go of your salary. But it's not easy being told you're mad. Uncle Peter, if I am afflicted, then... Then all those people must have known. That's why they discharged me. But how did they know... What did I do that would give evidence? Perhaps, perhaps you do things you're not aware of. Maybe I do. Seems the only logical answer. Oh, Uncle Pete. What's to become of me? Now, 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 we'll work this out together, my dear child. No one will ever know. You can depend upon me. I won't leave you. From tonight on, I shall be taken upstairs and I'll stay near you. Knowing that which afflicts us gives us a weapon with which to fight it. Just you rely upon me, my dear. Oh, Uncle Pete. Oh, Uncle Pete. Yes, who is it? Ray Alden. I must see you for a moment. Very well. Better not close it. I'll have to talk quietly. Something wrong? Terribly wrong. The old gentleman's asleep in the next room. I had to wait till he dozed off before I could see you. Well? It's about the head. The head? The one he calls Charlie. It's back in its case. When did this happen? Sometime last night, I guess. After your nightmare. Yes, I'm convinced now that that's all it was. I am not so sure. What? When you threw Charlie to the floor, a piece of his ear broke off. I found it after you went downstairs. Here, here it is. It's Charlie's ear, all right. I checked it very carefully. Oh, no, this doesn't make sense. Did you ring for me, miss? No, no, Victor, no, I... I didn't ring. Oh. Sorry, miss. Excuse me. Miss Redford, you're in grave danger. You've got to leave this house as quickly as you can and never come back. What's going on in here? Uncle. What was that I heard you telling my niece, Clay? I said she should leave this house and never come back. All the impudence. Alden, explain yourself. I'll be glad to, sir. I think Miss Medford is in danger of losing her sanity as well as her life. What is all this poppycock? Are you trying to frighten my niece? Lord knows she's been through enough. She's been through too much. If she weren't made of pretty stout stuff, she'd have been a gibbering idiot by this time. Alden, you're packing your things and leaving at once. Leaving? I'm afraid you're wrong, sir. I'm not leaving. Not yet. Maybe you're leaving. Mr. Alden, what's the meaning of this? I'm sorry to break it to you this way, but I'm definitely convinced your uncle is a diabolical fiend. I can take so much and no more. Look here, Alden. If you know what's good for you, you'll leave here at once. At once, do you hear? You're pretty anxious to get rid of me, but it's too late. Miss Medford, you remember your father's will. You'd come into your money only if you married. Well, if you didn't marry, Uncle Peter would get the money. And if he could prove you were insane, you'd never be able to marry. You see how it all works out? Well, how dare you, Mr. Alden? Listen to that maniac. Listen to me, Miss Medford. Your uncle, your loving uncle, was the one who telephoned your employers and told them you were crazy. Phineas Drake and all the others told me so today. I don't believe it. Lies, lies, lies. Why, your uncle even told me you were crazy. I know what's happened. He himself smashed the lock and took the head from its case and planted it last night in your room. If you'll stand on a chair and look above your bed as I did this afternoon, you'll see a small radio loudspeaker. It's hooked up to a microphone in the backstairs hallway. 
The voice you heard was your Uncle Peter. I don't believe you. Last night, after you came out in the hallway, your Uncle Peter grabbed up the head, stepped out onto that balcony, and climbed down the vines to his study. Why, he's as mad as a March hare. How could I possibly be a party to such a monstrous plot? Why, I can't even walk. Look, look at this ear, a piece of Charlie's ear. I found it in Marie's room. That proves she wasn't dreaming, and it fits perfectly. I've tried it. Why, you... Give me that ear. Give it to me! Uncle Peter! You're walking! Give it to me! Look! Look at him, Marie, standing unaided. Does that prove anything to you? Uncle Peter! Oh! And it's true. All right. All right, it's true. I can walk. But you are insane, Marie. Insane! You'll never marry anyone, Marie. I'll see to that. Victor, grab him. Don't move, Mr. Medford. Easy now. Don't believe what Alden says. You're crazy, Marie. There's no escaping it. You'll have those dreams, and Charlie will visit you every night. You'll hear him saying, My name's Charlie. My name's Charlie. My name's Charlie. <laughs> Hold him, Victor. <laughs> Got him, sir. Oh, I think you're the one who's crazy, Medford. Maybe that could be proved. Take your hands off me. Take it easy now, Mr. Medford. Take it easy. There's nothing wrong with me. You know it. Is the car ready, Victor? Yes, it's ready. Come in, gentlemen. These are the officers. Yeah, then you'd better take him away. Yes, sir. Please come quietly, Mr. Medford. I'm not crazy. I'm not. Hello. You're lying on me. You're lying. Lying, you hear? You're lying. I... I'm terribly sorry about this, Marie. Terribly sorry. But it's all for the best. But how can it be for the best? What well, think what this means? He's my father's brother, and if he's insane, then, then it means that I might be too. Run from the panel. No, no, don't worry, Marie. Don't worry, you're safe. You're perfectly normal, I know. No? Yes. You see, he wasn't your real uncle. He was your father's foster brother. I found proof. So you see, you've nothing, nothing in the world to fear. How do you know that? Someday, Marie, I'll tell you all about it. Tomorrow, maybe. Why don't you tell her now, Clay? Tell her why you were working as Peter Medford's secretary. Because your father was Peter's partner. His partner. That your father was ruined in business by Peter and killed himself. Killed himself in disgrace. That you suspected him of having cheated your father. That you came to find the evidence and discovered in time Peter's diabolical plan to prevent Marie from ever marrying. Better tell her, Clay. <laughs> I won't. <laughs> CBS has presented The Whistler. Original music for this production was composed and conducted by Wilbur Hatch. Tonight's Whistler story was written by Joseph Kearns, directed by J. Donald Wilson, and originated from Columbia Square in Hollywood. Next week, same time... I, The Whistler will return to tell you the strange story of the curse. Good night. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Lord of the Elements wants to change reality. He's enlisted the evil Zeltan to help him, and together they'll try to recruit Stanley, a man gifted with incredible imaginative capabilities to help them. Unless Edward and his friends can stop them, that is. A tale of white and black magic, quantum physics, and a plot that twists and turns. If you like science fiction, fantasy, and horror, you'll love the Last Observer, A Magic Battle for Reality by G. Michael Vasey. Narrated by Weird Darkness host Darren Marlar. Hear a free sample of The Last Observer on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com.
Welcome back to Weird Darkness. I'm Darren Marlar. North Brother Island has a long history of disease and devastation. Once home to a rehab facility and a hospital that specialized in infectious illnesses, the island lies abandoned today. Nature has taken over. Buildings are covered in foliage so dense it sometimes obscures the structures altogether. It may not have the creepy legacy of Central Park, but North Brother has plenty of infamy scattered throughout its unusual history. Before being designated a bird sanctuary as it is today, it has seen its fair share of sickness and corruption. Structural safety concerns have prompted the city of New York to close the land to the public. Although there have been discussions about reopening certain areas and reporters and city officials are allowed to visit with the approval of the Parks Department, North Brothers' reopening would require substantial work. The infamous Typhoid Mary, Mary Mallon, infected dozens of people with her namesake disease. As one of the first asymptomatic carriers of typhoid, she inadvertently passed it on to more than 50 unwitting victims. Investigators eventually identified her as the disease carrier and quarantined her to North Brother Island, where she lived in a bungalow before suffering a paralyzing stroke that landed her in Riverside Hospital. She passed six years later. Though she is buried in the Bronx, she's rumored to haunt the island where she was held against her will for 26 years. A steamship called General Slocum burst into flames just off the coast of North Brother Island in 1904. The captain attempted to quickly sail to the shore, but the ship's speed only fanned the fire. By the time General Slocum reached North Brother, the ship had been swallowed up by flames. Most of the passengers couldn't swim and the life vests on board failed them. Lifeboats were inaccessible. Roughly a thousand people died in the incident, which marked the largest loss of life in New York until 9-11. In 1885, the city of New York purchased North Brother Island to build Riverside Hospital, a medical facility originally intended for smallpox patients. Riverside eventually began to treat other infectious diseases, including typhus, tuberculosis, and polio. Riddled with controversy, the hospital often reached capacity and staff regularly used poorly sterilized medical tools. When no more hospital beds could fit inside specific sections of the building, patients were placed in outdoor tents. These tents occasionally caught fire as they were heated with wooden stoves. No telegraph or phone lines existed for Riverside as late as 1894, leaving it extremely isolated. There was a morgue in the hospital to process the bodies of the many people who perished on its grounds. When the city of New York gained authority over the island from New York State in 1951, North Brother Island became a treatment center for young people addicted to opioids and other substances. The program, however, expensive and riddled with corruption, was shut down in 1963. In the 1990s, city officials looking for a purpose for North Brother Island contemplated expanding the federal prison complex on nearby Rikers Island. Ultimately, they decided against it. Rikers has a controversial past itself, with prisoners themselves having expanded the prison grounds using literal garbage shipped to the island. In its early days, the prison developed a massive rat infestation, a problem that even large packs of hungry, hunting dogs couldn't solve. Rikers became known for its lawlessness. Prisoners frequently committed acts of aggression against one another as well as the prison's guards. New York State's former chief judge, Jonathan Lippman, described Rikers as a penal colony and a 19th century solution to a 21st century problem. Because of North Brothers' proximity to Rikers, police patrol the East River, which connects the two. Business insider journalist Dave Mosher noticed their presence, observing that authorities seemed weary of people visiting North Brother, giving its proximity to one of the country's largest prisons. After advances in public health made quarantine-based treatment obsolete, Riverside Hospital was used as housing for soldiers studying at colleges in New York under the GI Bill. After World War II, the state converted Riverside's men's dorms into Island Nursery School, which served as housing for soldiers' children. This arrangement lasted for five years until the state's lease on the island expired 
in 1951. Today, North and South Brother Island are together protected nesting sites for the herons, as well as other shorebirds. My doc agrees that I need to lose a few pounds. I knew that going in, but he also told me that the meds I'm taking for my type 2 diabetes aren't going to do me much good if I finish each meal with ice cream or cheesecake. I kind of knew that in advance, too. But cutting back on carbs and sugars is, is a lot easier said than done. I've tried a lot of protein bars while on the road, but I swear it's like eating non-sweetened, chocolate-dusted particle board. But now I travel with Built Bars. Built Bars taste like candy bars. In fact, I'm now using them for my dessert. And at about 150 calories per bar, less than 3 grams of sugar, up to 19 grams of protein, I can satisfy my sweet cravings guilt-free. Visit WeirdDarkness.com slash built and try a box. You can go for a variety pack of several flavors to try or pick and choose to build a box of your own. Use the promo code WeirdDarkness at checkout and get 10% off your entire purchase. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash built. Strange Wills. Starring the distinguished Hollywood actor Warren William and featuring Carlton Young and Howard Culver with an all star Hollywood cast. Original music by Del Castillo. Dead men's wills are often strange. We cannot attempt to understand them or try to find the answers. We can but tell the story. This is Marvin Miller bringing you sales highlights of radio's newest and most sensational transcribed show, Strange Wills. What makes Strange Wills so outstanding? The answer is simple. These are strange stories of strange wills made under strange circumstances. They are unusual, different, exciting. Strange Wills is a show that cannot be typed. Suspense, romance, psychological drama, comedy, love, intrigue. Yes, every human emotion, every strange, unusual story behind man's last written declaration is brought forth and dramatized by Hollywood's greatest radio cast. Starring the distinguished Hollywood actor Warren William, Strange Wills has, in supporting roles, a host of names that have made radio history. Names such as Will Wright, John Brown, Carlton Young, Peggy Weber, Lureen Tuttle, Charlie Lung, Perry Ward, and Howard Culver. Strange Wills is written by Ken Crippine, lawyer and writer, who spent over ten years searching through probate files in courts all over the world for material that would guarantee the finest program ever to be heard on the air. Imagine a program that took ten years to build. Direction is under the very capable and brilliant producer, Robert Webster Light. All of this means only one thing. Strange Wills is radio fare that is different, exciting, and unusual in story content. There is nothing like it on the air. But now let me substantiate these claims. Let's take romance. In the Strange Wills story, The Prince of Broadway, Harry McNeil, actor's agent, falls desperately in love with his young and beautiful protege, Judy Morrison. But in the code of the theater, career comes before love. Knowing that he can never put Judy in big time where she belongs, he wills her to his competitor and then joins the RAF. But Judy wouldn't stay put. She searched the battlefields of the world for Harry. And then finally one day in a little hospital just outside Munich... Well, let's listen to the scene. We have only about 60 patients... They are nationals of every country in the war. Are they all blind, Doctor? Most of them. But we have about 20 who are psychopathic cases. We are especially happy that you have come, Miss Morrison. You see, we have learned that musical therapy is very beneficial as a means of recovery. Mm -hmm. In many instances, our medical knowledge is of little value. Uh, well, if you are ready... You come too, John, won't you? Of course, if I can be of help. Uh, come this way, please. <laughs> Our piano survived the war, but I'm afraid it's badly out of tune. 
Uh, here we are. Many of them are seriously wounded as well as blind. Oh, John, how horrible. Frau Zimmermann will accompany you. Do you have your music? Oh, yes, Doctor, here it is. I'll walk around the room as I sing. You see, Doctor, I'm looking for a certain soldier. In fact, I've been looking now for almost four years. Uh? He's listed as missing in action. Uh, what is his name? McNeil. Major Harry McNeil of the Royal Air Force. I am sorry, Miss Morrison, but our records do not... Yes, I know. I've heard that from London to Berlin. But I'm still looking. When my dream boat comes home When my dreams no more will roam I will meet you Judy sang her heart out to those boys, just as she'd done month after month, year after year. She visited every bed, looking, hoping, praying. Many of the patients were swathed in bandages from head to foot. How she ever hoped to identify Harry was beyond understanding. But as she stood there, literally singing with eyes full of tears, she was a picture I'll never forget. The late afternoon sun came streaming into the room and formed an aura of light over her head. She looked like and was an angel of mercy. Like it? Well, who doesn't like love and romance? Now, let's switch over to psychological drama. It's the strange will story of Mad Concerto, the story of a girl who inherited ten million dollars from a wealthy admirer, if... A big if, too, if she would live alone the rest of her life and never marry. Warren William, as John Francis O'Connell, probate lawyer, visits the home of his client for the first time. It is then that he sees Nadia Winter. Let's go into the house with him. Come in, please, Mr. O'Connell. Mr. Walker is waiting for you. He's in his study on the second floor. Thank you very much. As I entered the door, I stopped. It was like a beautiful dream come true. I mean her, of course. She was sitting at a concert grand piano, completely engrossed in her music. She was exquisite, something out of a picture book. She had a wild, barbarous look, and her blonde hair seemed to keep tempo with the strange, savage music she was playing. As I passed her, she glanced up for just a fleeting moment, and I saw she had brown eyes. Eyes that seemed to probe deeply into my soul. She held me with a long and tense look, and then I lowered my eyes and followed the servant up the stairs. Who was this strange creature, this most beautiful, most sensuous of women? Even the scent of her exotic perfume reached out like tentacles of doom and encircled me. Unfortunately, I was to learn later. Wonder what happened? Well, how about asking your Telaway's representative to play the whole show? He'll do so gladly. Did you ever hear the story about the man who carved his last will on the back of a woman? He was a pirate, she a lady. After a terrific sea battle in which both ships were sunk, the pirate and the lady ended up on a desolate island. He wanted his estate in England to go to his little island in the Bahamas called Freeland, and the lady was willing. We won't tell you what happened on that lonely island. But in any event, John Francis O'Connell, the first British barrister and king's agent, accompanied the lady back to England in order to help her claim the pirate's inheritance. Suppose we listen to this thrilling and unforgettable scene from the lady and the pirate. My ultimate decision was clearly defined when I accompanied Lady Ruth Carroll back to London in order to help her in proving the last will and testament of Black Richard. We were summoned before the House of Peers. I presented her case. My lords, because of the mitigating circumstances which will be known to you, the last will and testament of the deceased can never be actually filed. But I have brought the sole beneficiary before this august body 
in order that each of you can personally examine the document. Lady Ruth Carroll, I ask you now to disrobe before the House of Peers. Oh, believe me, my lords, I do not show disrespect to either Lady Ruth Carroll or to you. Rest assured that only her back will be exposed. Are you ready, my lady? Yes, Mr. O'Connell. Will you please walk up to the lords, my lady, and let them examine your back? And with your permission, my lords, I shall read the words tattooed across her back. All to bearer. Signed, Sir George Pemberton, 1724. Many of you remember Sir George Pemberton. He sailed for the colonies ten years ago. Little was heard of him since, save only that he purchased an island in the Bahamas. But by fate or providence, as you will, Sir George Pemberton lived long enough to carve his last will and testament on the back of his own sister. Strange wills made by strange people. Yes, what entertainment, what a show. All the world loves a lover, and that's exactly why you will find the Strange Will story, Seven Flights to Glory, one of the most beautiful, most poignant ever to be told on the air. Lucy Witherspoon, old, dominant, and willful, gave her son and only heir at law the choice of inheriting the industrial empire she had created or the sum of $5,000 and a ticket to Paris. Bob, her son, wanted to be an artist more than anything in life, more even than the millions of dollars his mother offered. And so he took the ticket to Paris. And in so choosing, he lost the love of his fiancée. Well, what happened? Leave it to John Francis O'Connell. He played a fast game to mend two broken hearts. Here is the final heartwarming scene in Seven Flights to Glory. This is the last time I'm going to walk up seven flights for a long time to come. Seven flights to glory. A little bit tarnished just now, but I still love it. As soon as you've found a new model, you'll start over? Yes, but no more entanglements. From now on, it's art. Pure, unadulterated art. The next time I hear a girl say money, I'll... Well, ring. here we are. Permit me to uh, open the door. Yeah. Uh, John... John, where did you... where did you find that model? What a figure. Golden hair, wonderful proportions. Uh, hey, you, turn around. I, I want to see the face that comes with that perfect back. Uh, Catherine. Kay. Okay. Bob. Oh, Bob, darling. What on earth are you doing here? How in the... I moved to Paris, Bob. I took a job as a model. Mr. O'Connell offered it to me. You... you want a model? I... I can't... It's true, Bob, it's true. I want to be your model. And I'm going to live right here in the Latin Quarter, if you'll let me. Oh, I was so wrong. So wrong. Don't cry, darling. I was wrong, too. But come on, take off that robe and put on your dress and we'll find a place for you to live. I found one already. You have a place to live? Oh, I don't believe it. Where is it? it? It's here, Bob. Right here in the studio. Here, here with all this paint and smells and canvases lying around. Uh -huh. See, I, I thought we could both live here very nicely. Both live here? But both of us? Yes, darling, both of us. This morning I stopped off and got us a marriage license. I thought maybe we'd still have time. Time. To... Time to start our glorious adventure? Oh, yes, darling, we have. A lifetime from this day on. Do you like horror? Do you like stories about the moors of Scotland, deadly moors covered with fog, and the eerie sounds of strange moor creatures? Add to that a murder. All of these ingredients put together spell 30 minutes of exciting, never-to-be-forgotten radio fare. This unusual strange will story, called Midnight on the Moor, is replete with dynamic intensity that will keep you on edge until the murderer is brought to bay. Let's listen to a short scene from Midnight on the Moor, 
See how easily you can be transplanted from wherever you are to the fog-swept moors of Scotland and a funeral. Dear brethren, we are all gathered here this night at the Castle McClanahan in the last tribute to the late departed Sir Walter McClanahan. In Mr. O'Connell's absence, I will take upon myself as minister of the gospel the duty of reading the will. According to the wishes of the late deceased Sir Walter McClanahan, the coffin is to be opened, and his heirs at law will respectfully take seats around the coffin. Will you please wheel in the remains? Aye, right here in this room. Now, that's fine, lad, thank you. And now then, will you please remove the cover? Sit it right over near the fire, please. Would the five of you please draw your chairs up to the foot of the coffin? Oh, oh how ghastly. Must we sit here and look into his dead face? It was his wish, Mr. Son. He was a peculiar one, my brother Walter was. Ever since that night when Moffat disappeared into the fog. Uncle Andrew, must you bring that? I'm sorry, lassie. I cannot help but think of that night. It made of him a madman. He always said that he would find the murderer of his son before he was laid to rest. This is his last chance. His last chance. Who said adventure? Well, Strange Wills has more than its quota. Let's examine the Strange Wills story, Emeralds Come High. Mix a grizzled old prospector and an emerald mine in the green hell of Columbia. Add the curvaceous and beautiful Patsy Bubbles Moran, Queen of Burlesque. Add to that a handsome young mining engineer. Sprinkle lightly with headhunters who capture Patsy and make her their queen. Drop into this concoction the rhythmic beat of jungle drums of a burlesque dance deep in the heart of the Colombian jungle. Shake well. And, uh, well, let's really give it a shake and see what comes out. Patsy Moran had disappeared as completely as though the jungle had swallowed her up. We searched everywhere, but not a single clue could we find. Steve, Peter, and I were forced to the conclusion that she'd been captured by the headhunters. As soon as the storm abated, we decided to increase the perimeter of our search. By twos, we spread out in an ever-widening circle. A little later... Bossman! Bossman, come! That's Tulu. Come. That's Tulu. He must have found something. Let's hurry. Coming, Tulu. See, Bossman? One tree. Tulu find hair. Red hair. Hey, that belongs to Patsy, all right. Now let's look around and try to find some more. We can trail her right to their village if we're lucky. Here's another one over here. Looks as though Patsy is deliberately letting her hair get caught in the underbrush. She's showing us the way. Drums beat closer. We're getting closer to their encampment now. Be careful where you step. We can't let them hear us. Shh. Look. Over here between these bushes. That's the village, all right. What's going on? I can't see. Looks like they're having their ceremonial dance. All of the Hibaro tribe are sitting in a semicircle. Someone must be dancing. See how they keep swaying to the throb of the drums? That's their dance of victory. I hope that doesn't I make... don't think we're too late. They all dance around a new head. Now only one is dancing. I'll go up closer. Wait here. Hey, crawl over here. We can see everything. One at a time. You go first, John. Take a look, John. There's a sight to remember. Shades of Minsky. It's Patsy. And she's dancing. What a dance. Broadway never saw anything like that. We've got to let her know we're here. Wait. With all these birds raising bedlam around us, I think I can do it. What are you going to do? I'll give her the wolf whistle. <laughs> She'll recognize that. She didn't hear you. Do it again. She heard it. Hey, she's giving us a message. Heard you, heard you. Dancing too. Save my head. They want to make me their queen. Come back tonight. Same place. See you then. See you then. Say, 
I want to hear the rest of that one, too. <laughs> Strange Wills. All right, let's admit it. Have you heard anything on the air as versatile, as strikingly different? But listen, we're coming up with thrills and chills. In this next Strange Will chapter, entitled Margin for Love, Tim Ryan is scheduled to die in the electric chair for a murder of which he is innocent. John Francis O'Connell, admirably played by Warren William, learns of his innocence just 30 minutes before the switch is to be thrown at the state prison. He is attempting to reach the governor to tell him of the news. It is 30 minutes to midnight, and a storm is raging over the state. Let's listen to this most thrilling scene from Margin for Love. Busy, sir. Why, I haven't even reached the operator. Operator, operator, operator. Number, please. Operator, listen to me. This is John Francis O'Connell, attorney at law. Put in a long-distance call to the governor's residence for me. A man is scheduled to die in 17 minutes. One moment, please. I'll connect you with long distance. Oh, all right. Long distance. Long distance. This is John O'Connell, attorney at law. I want to place a call, an emergency call, to the governor's residence. A man's life I'm is... sorry, sir, but there'll be a slight delay. All of the circuits are busy. Oh, hang the circuits. I tell you, a man's life is in danger. A man is to die at midnight. I tell you... One moment, please. I'll connect you with my supervisor. Oh, hang the supervisor. I want the governor's mansion. This is the supervisor speaking. Supervisor, listen... In just nine minutes, a man is scheduled to die in the electric chair. I have evidence to save him. I'm sorry, sir. I can't make up what you're saying. Supervisor, supervisor, don't leave the line. I want the governor. The governor. Do you understand me? Get me the governor. One moment, please. I'll try and connect you. Shall I frighten you? Only five minutes to midnight. Only five minutes. No, I'll, I'll have him in a moment. <laughs> Well, for those who want to know what happened, contact your Telaways representative or write direct to Telaways Radio Productions of Hollywood. It's a smash ending unsurpassed in modern radio drama and loaded from start to finish with suspense. Uh, did I hear a quiet, well-modulated voice say, give me music? Well, good, I wholeheartedly agree. Let's take out the strange will show called Emily. We will hear the music of the masters. Emily is the story of a violin, a violin made by that great craftsman, Antonio Stradivari, way back in 1732. Emily is the life story of that violin, the only violin that the great master named after a girl, the girl he deeply loved and never married because she became a nun. What happened to Emily down through the centuries is a classic of modern storytelling, how she grew in tone and stature, how she laughed with the gypsies and cried under a dictator makes one of the most beautiful stories of all times. Let's listen for a few minutes to a scene of this great radio show. Emily has been stolen by the gypsies. <laughs> These were glorious days for Emily, and from the enchanted woodlands of Italy she traveled north through the Balkans, up through the forests of Russia, ever singing, ever living, ever growing. At night under the moon, the gypsies would gather round their campfires and sing their ancient songs of Romany. Emily pulsed with warmth and feeling. She must have loved the gypsies, and they loved her. For almost 30 years, she traveled from the steppes of Russia to the sunny provincial towns of Spain. One day, the little gypsy band entered Vienna. As was their custom, they wandered through the city singing songs, telling fortunes, and, of course, playing Emily. As they played their wild gypsy music, a man opened his window in the olden house and looked down into the street. Hey, they're gypsies. Who gives a pug any competition? 
Who owns it at the violin? It belongs to us, Maestro Paganini. To us, the gypsies of Romany. I want to look at it. Bring it up, please, to Sweet 200. But we are not allowed to enter the public buildings, Maestro. We are gypsies. It is against the law. <laughs> when a Paganini says to enter, you enter. With a violin such as you have, you could storm the very gates of paradise. Come in, I say. <laughs> Uh, oh, come in, gypsy girl, come in. Thank you. Thank you, Maestro Paganini. Hey, but where are the others? I invited them all. Oh, they will wait for me outside. We gypsies are not worthy of the invitation of the great maestro. Ah, uh, you gypsies. <laughs> what simple children you are. You cry and laugh. <laughs> Much as the children do. But I envy you. I, Maestro Paganini, envy you with my whole heart. Envy us gypsies? Oh, the Maestro is making fun. No, no, no. No, I speak what is in my heart. I envy you gypsies because you alone know the wonderment of nature. You alone witness the miracles of God. And you alone have the fear of life. Oh, give me the violin, please. I, I would look at it. Oh, yes, yes. Here it is, Maestro. Oh. Let us walk over here to the window. The light is much better. Oh. The work on the ship is firm. Oh, wait. Wait till let me look inside. There. I see the signature... <gasps> I knew when I heard that tone, I was not mistaken. Antonio Stradivarius, 1732. Emily. 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 So this is the violin that the whole world has been searching for. This is Emily. It's the greatest of all creations. Emily? Emily, I, I do not understand. This is the one violin Stradivarius named after a girl. They say she was his boy with a sweetheart before she came a nun. He never forgot. And he named his violin after her. And to think it belongs to us, the gypsies. Ah, but Maestro Paganini, Emily has been happy with us. She sings just as we do and cries, and she dances our gypsy dances. Just as though she was born one of us. May I play it? Oh, maestro, that would make all of us happy. Emily played by the great Paganini. <laughs> oh, it is a divine. I, I cannot live without it. I offer one thousand lira. A thousand lira? Oh, no, maestro. Two thousand and three? No, maestro Paganini. Oh, no. Oh, how much, then? In the name of the prize. How much to make Emily mine? I must have. You shall not leave this room until we strike a bar. Gypsies are strange people, maestro. My father instructed me to tell you that if you love the violin, then it is to be yours. For what the price, gypsy girl? The price is this. That you shall play one of our beloved songs of Romani. For us now. Look, look out at the window. You see? They stand on the street below, waiting for you to play. Yes. There they stand, all of them, looking up here. You see now, Gypsy Girl, why? What I meant when I said it, you Gypsies were God's most beloved children. If, if I cry a little, pay no attention. I'm a silly, sentimental fool. You gypsies below. You shall have your song of Romany and more. You shall have the eternal love of the great Paganini. I vow you this before the blessed mother. Viva Maestro Paganini! Viva Maestro Paganini!
now, ladies and gentlemen, what do you think of Strange Wills as America's top dramatic radio show? There isn't any type of client in cities large or small who wouldn't benefit from buying this exceptionally beautiful show. And as for listening audience, I promise you, once a listener, always a listener. For further information about Strange Wills, write or wire direct to Telaway's Radio Productions, Incorporated. 8949 Sunset Boulevard, Hollywood 46, California. Or telephone Crestview 67238. Strange Wills may still be available for your market. I can only add that to assure yourself of strange wills, wire or write today. This is Marvin Miller saying, what is more strange, more fascinating, more exciting than the true stories of strange wills made by strange people? Strange Wills. Starring the distinguished Hollywood actor Warren William and featuring Carlton Young and Howard Culver with an all-star Hollywood cast. Original music by Del Castillo. Dead men's wills are often strange. We cannot attempt to understand them or try to find the answers. We can but tell the story. This is a Telaways feature... Produced in Hollywood. If you like what you're hearing on Weird Darkness, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can find information on sponsors you heard during the show, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, find other podcasts that I host. You can visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. And if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell of your own, you can click on Tell Your Story. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Welcome back to Weird Darkness. I'm Darren Marlar. Do you have a true paranormal story that has happened to you or someone you know? Share it by clicking on Tell Your Story at WeirdDarkness.com. I might use your story in a future episode. Throughout history, there have been many women who have murdered their husbands or partners. Motives have ranged from rage, jealousy, hate, and greed. These women are often labeled black widows by the media. Let's look at the murderous actions of ten black widows. Chisako Kakahi, a Japanese woman, murdered at least four men, all of which were her husbands, before eventually being caught. Kakahi, dubbed the Black Widow by Japanese media, sought her victims on various dating websites. Her criteria was always the same. They needed to be rich, childless, elderly, and lonely. Once lured, she would poison them with cyanide, either putting it in their drinks or even placing it in medicine capsules. Her motive for these killings was to collect the insurance money. She managed to collect $12 million in insurance and inheritance payments, though she ended up falling into debt from poor investment decisions. In 2017, Kakehi was eventually arrested after the death of her fourth husband, only after a single month of marriage. She confessed to the crime, saying she killed him because he gave money to other women but never any to her. She was sentenced to death. Dubbed the Torso Murderer, Evelyn Dick's case is one of the most sensationalized in Canadian crime history. A bunch of schoolchildren made a shocking discovery in 1944 while walking in the woods. The torso of Evelyn's missing husband, John Dick, a streetcar driver. His head and arms were missing, 
which were later discovered to have been burned in the furnace of their home. Suspicion fell on Evelyn. She was convicted of the murder in 1946 and was sentenced to death by hanging. Her lawyer appealed her case, and she was acquitted. However, in a shocking turn of events, Evelyn Dick's baby boy was found encased in cement under the floorboards of her home. This had her right back in court, charged for murder again. She was sentenced to 11 years in prison and was released in 1958. No one knows what came of this murderess after her release with a new identity and parole and case records sealed by essentially a royal pardon. Betty Lou Beats was married six times, twice to the same man. She attempted to murder two of them. First, she shot Bill Lane in the back of the head, twice. The two divorced after this, but later remarried before separating again. She then tried to run over her third husband, Ronnie Threckheld, with her car. Both of these men would later testify at her murder trial. In 1983, Beats reported her sixth husband, Jimmy Don Beats, was missing. However, it was later discovered that she told her son, Robert Branson, to leave the house as she intended to murder Jimmy. Rob was then asked to help conceal the murder by hiding the body in the front yard and planting Jimmy's heart medication on his boat before abandoning the boat in a lake. This was done so it would appear that Jimmy had fallen overboard and drowned. The lake was dragged, with Jimmy's body not being discovered. After a search warrant was issued, the bodies of Jimmy as well as Doyle Wayne Barker, who was another former husband of Beats, were found on her property. She was arrested and later sentenced to death by a lethal injection. Texas carried out her execution on February 24, 2000. Stacy Castor was dubbed the Black Widow after murdering her then-husband, David Castor, in 2005. She poisoned him with antifreeze, an odorless and colorless poison. She also attempted to murder her daughter, Ashley Wallace, by mixing pills into her drink in 2007. Stacy was also suspected of murdering her first husband, Michael Wallace, after his body was exhumed and traces of antifreeze crystals were found when examined. Initially, the coroner ruled that David Castor's death was a suicide by drinking antifreeze. However, Stacy Castor's fingerprints were found on the antifreeze bottle, and a turkey baster was discovered in the trash. It was suspected that she force-fed the antifreeze to her husband using the turkey baster. In 2009, Castor was convicted of murder and attempted murder and sentenced to 51 years in prison. She died in prison of a heart attack in 2016. Belle Gunnis would lure suitors to her Indiana farm with the promise of marriage and hospitality before murdering them in cold blood. Her murderous actions were discovered after her house burned to the ground with her and her children still inside. Upon investigation of the Gunnis farm, authorities noticed a number of soft depressions in the earth. After digging, a bag of human remains was found. Upon further inspection, dozens of these depressions in the ground were identified, each containing a sack of human remains. After uncovering five bags on the first day of digging and six on the second, it's reported that the police simply stopped counting. The exact body count of Belle Gunnis is not exactly known, but it's been estimated she could have killed up to 40 people. Despite being declared dead in the house fire, it's speculated that she escaped the flames, with some sightings of her in the Chicago area being recorded long after her supposed death. Mary Ann Cotton was an English woman suspected of murdering three of her four husbands to collect their insurance policies. She carried out these murders through arsenic poisoning. Each of her then-husbands fell ill with gastric issues, and with each of them eventually passing away, she would then collect money from their policies. Her downfall didn't come until the death of her stepson, Charles Edward Cotton, who was labeled a sickly boy. Upon his death, she attested that she had tried to help the ailing boy through the administration of Arrowroot. But when the newspapers came across this case and found that Mary Ann had lost three husbands, a lover, and eleven children, all to stomach issues? Well, the gig was up. After examining Charles's body, traces of arsenic were found and Mary was promptly arrested. She was found guilty and hanged in 1873. Nanny Doss, or the self-made widow, was an American serial killer who murdered four husbands, two children, 
her sister, her mother, two grandsons, and a mother-in-law. Even after all these deaths, she was sometimes referred to as the giggling granny. She was first married at the age of 16 to a co-worker by the name of Charlie Braggs, and they had four children together, two of which died from suspected food poisoning. The marriage ended in divorce. She very quickly married Robert Franklin Harrelson, a marriage that lasted 16 years until she poisoned him with rat poison after he sexually assaulted her. Her later marriages included Arlie Lanning, who died from a suspected heart attack, and Richard Morton, who she poisoned. Though before she poisoned him, she poisoned her own mother. Her reign of terror came to an abrupt end after murdering her fourth husband, Samuel Doss. An autopsy revealed heavy amounts of arsenic in his system, and she was arrested. She was sentenced to life in prison. She died of leukemia in 1965. Amy Duggan's sister, Archer Gilligan, worked in a nursing home, Archer Home for the Elderly and Infirm, founded by Amy's husband, James Archer. Unfortunately, James Archer later died from Bright's disease, a genetic condition applied to kidney disorders at the time. Only a few weeks before his death, Amy took out a life insurance policy on her husband. With this, she was able to continue to run the Archer Home. She later married Michael W. Gilligan, who died only after three months of marriage from severe indigestion. Over the years, there were many deaths at the Archer Nursing Home. Between 1911 and 1916, 48 residents died, including Franklin R. Andrews. Andrews' family, including his sister Nellie Pierce, grew suspicious of these events. She went to the media about it, which resulted in several articles on the deaths being published. However, it wasn't until a year later that Amy was arrested. The bodies of some of the Archer Home residents were exhumed, and it was discovered that they had died from arsenic or strychnine poisoning. Amy was arrested and was initially sentenced to death, but later Amy pleaded insanity and she was transferred to a mental facility for the remainder of her life. Elizabeth Ann Broderick, or simply Betty Broderick, she killed her husband and his second wife while they slept in their home. Betty's divorce from her ex-husband, Daniel T. Broderick III, was very public. The Broderick v. Broderick case became one of the most infamous divorce cases in the United States. This was primarily because Betty worked to put her then-husband through postgraduate school so that he could become a lawyer. After the divorce, Daniel married his legal assistant, Linda Kokina, with whom he later admitted to having had an affair while still married to Betty. Betty became embittered leaving violent voice messages on Daniel's phone and sending strange gifts to Linda on her wedding day. On the night of Sunday, November 5, 1989, Betty broke into Daniel and Linda's home, killing them while they slept. She shot Linda first, killing her instantly, and afterward shot Daniel as he was reaching for the phone. Daniel did not die instantly, and later Betty admitted talking to him as he lay dying. Betty was convicted of two counts of second-degree murder and was sentenced to 32 years in prison. She remains incarcerated in California after parole hearings in 2010 and 2017 did not grant her release. Her next parole hearing is scheduled for 2032. Susan Wright tied her husband Jeff Wright to their bed and stabbed him a total of 193 times with two different kinds of knives. She later buried him in the backyard and painted the bedroom to try and hide the evidence. She later confessed to her attorney, citing that she killed her husband in self-defense. During her trial, Susan testified that her husband was abusive and, on the night of his murder, high on cocaine. She killed him to protect both herself and their two children from his drug-fueled rage. However, the prosecutor painted a different picture of the situation citing that Susan wished to collect the $200,000 in life insurance money. She was convicted of murder in 2005 and was sentenced to 25 years in prison. A resentencing appeal lowered her sentence to 20 years in 2010, based on witness testimony about Susan's husband's abusive behavior. In December 2020, she was granted parole and released from incarceration. A 
About a year ago, I began getting tons of notifications about how somebody was trying to log into my social media. I was getting email phishing scams on a daily basis. I was being inundated with email sales pitches from companies I'd never even heard of. I was getting calls and texts from those same companies. I was listening to a podcast that talked about Incogni, short for incognito, and I thought I'd give it a try. For the past year, Incogni has reduced the number of email and spam calls and texts that I receive, it's helped to protect my identity from hackers, and helps keep my data safe. Over the past year, Incogni has successfully removed my personal information from over 200 different data brokerage sites, and I get regular updates on how many are still in progress, how many have been successfully completed, and how many requests were sent out to remove my personal information. It would have taken me over 160 hours to do all of this, and nobody has time or patience for that. Fortunately, it's all taken care of by Incogni. I live online, personally and professionally, and I trust Incogni to help me live with a lot less worry. You can give Incogni a try right now by visiting WeirdDarkness.com slash Incogni. That's short for incognito. I-N-C-O-G-N-I. WeirdDarkness.com slash Incogni. We bring you The Witch's Tale, written and produced by Alonzo Dean Cole. And now let us join old Nancy and Satan, her wise black cat. <laughs> Hannah and 17 year old I be today. Yes, sir. Hannah and 17 year old. Well, Satan, if these folks are just douse out their lights, We'll spin another of our little bedtime stories <laughs> to ruin their night's rest. That's right. Nice and dark and cheerful now. Draw up to the fire and gaze into embers. Gaze into them deep. And soon you'll see an island in the center of a lake in Michigan. Not so long ago, the Red Indians owned that land out there and worship the spirits of his waters and his skies. And they're what we're going to hear about tonight. The spirits of the lake. <laughs> the spirits of the lake. <laughs> Those filthy Indians intend to keep that racket going all night? Surely their chanting doesn't annoy you, dear. I was just thinking how weirdly beautiful it sounded coming across the water. Beautiful. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry you don't like it. You'll hear it every evening, as long as the new moon casts its reflection on the lake. It's a pleasant prospect. You're terribly bored here, aren't you? Oh, naturally I'm bored. I'm not accustomed to living in a wilderness where I see no one but stupid savages all day. Now you say I'll have to listen to them all night. But the reason I purchased this island so close to the Indian reservation was because I thought you'd find their customs interesting and picturesque. Ah. Roger, why don't you take a trip east? Then come back to me when you're, when you're over your restlessness. Fine idea, that would be. My friends would crucify me for leaving you alone. Is that the only reason you stay here with me? You do love me, don't you? 
I'm married to you. Husbands are supposed to love their wives. I'm in no mood for romance this evening. I don't suppose an invalid can expect her husband to be in a mood for romance, ever. But but I won't be an invalid much longer, dear. I, I'm getting better every day. I... <coughs> <coughs> it's really very seldom that I cough any more like that, but in a little while I'll, I'll be completely well and... And we can return to New York together or, or travel in Europe. Anything you want to do. Oh, I mean to give you such a good time to make up for the dreary months you've spent out here because of me. Thanks for reminding me that to have a good time, I'm dependent on your money. I didn't mean that. You know I didn't. Oh, all right. Let's not talk anymore about you and me. No. We don't seem able to talk of you and me. God. I have to listen to that savage, savage caterwauling much longer. I'll go stark raving mad. Perhaps, perhaps if you know the reason for the chanting, it, it might interest you a little. Uh, two horses told me all about it this afternoon. You know, he's the old Indian who comes to see our housekeeper. She's his cousin, I think. And, Roger, it's the funniest thing, but they call me White Goose. Well, <coughs> what about the chanting? <coughs> oh, yes. Well, it's a ceremony... The tribes hold each year at this time to appease the spirits of the lake. The Neba Norbegs, they call them. This is a holy lake to the Indians, you know. And they say that if anyone affronts it or harms its friends, the Neba Norbegs take terrible vengeance. <laughs> Two horses spoke so convincingly of terror, I made a peace offering. Peace offering? What do you mean? I cast a bouquet of flowers on its water and said a prayer. Two horses taught me. No wonder he calls you White Goose. Another month in this wilderness, and you'll be going about clothed in a blanket. Roger. Oh, I'm going out. I'll prowl around in the canoe and try to work my nerves off. Nama can sit with you. You'll enjoy her Indian grunting more than you would my conversation anyway. Now, Nama. Nama. Huh? Come in here with Mrs. Benton. I'm going out. Huh? We come. Roger, why not take me with you in the canoe? Oh. We haven't been together on the lake in weeks. Some other time, not now. Uh... Don't wait up for me. I may be late. Good night. Roger, wait. Well? You, you're not going to the Johansson's farm again. What do you mean, again? Oh, I, I know it's quite all right, dear, but, well, there's been a little talk about you and that girl there. That... Oh, there has, eh? I'm having an affair with Hilda Johansson, I suppose. Oh, no, dear, no. Oh, so that's what you have in your mind. It isn't bad enough that I have to be cooped up with you among these dirty Indians, but... Now I mustn't even look at a decent-looking white woman. Roger. Oh, how I hate it all. This beastly island, these stupid savages, this slimy lake. How I hate... George! Oh, I... I didn't say I hated you. I'll see you later. Good night. Oh, no. Oh, white girl. My... My husband doesn't mean anything when he speaks angrily to me, Nama. He, he's really a very good man, isn't he? Oh, he better be good if he go out on lake. What do you mean? You give flower to lake today. You say Indian prayer. Me, no begs, now your friend. If your man not good to you, me, no begs, punish. Me, no begs, punish. Ah. Hilda, I'm mad, insane about you. Why do you hold me off like this? Because you haven't any right to be insane about me. You're a married man. Oh, we're not children. You know I don't care a hang about my wife. Besides, it's only a question of time before she... Well... Before she'll die, you mean? Yes. She thinks she's getting better. The doctors don't tell her what they tell me. In the moment I'm free, I'll marry you, Hilda. I swear I will. I can't wait for you till then. I've got to have you, Hilda. I've Let me be... go. You'll only have me as your wife. I told you that before. Well, if, if you really mean it, why don't you stop making a fool of me? Why don't you stop meeting him here by this late me each night? Playing with me as a cat does with a mouse. Because I hope you'll not always be a mouse, but a man. And take what he wants. What do you mean? Simply that if you're so mad about me as you say... You'll not let a woman that you hate stand between us any longer. Well, what can I do to 
Divorce is out of the question. Of course. And our money would be taken from you. Oh, I'm not thinking only of money. I'm not thinking only of divorce. What are you thinking of? Of how mistaken doctors are sometimes. Your wife may live for years. Unless an accident should happen. An accident? On this lake, for instance. It's very deep. And there are sharp rocks near the surface that can rip a canoe to pieces. You might be paddling with her in the moonlight, not knowing those rocks were near. You told me your wife don't swim. She might drown before you could save her. You're suggesting... I'm only talking. But if such an accident should happen, you'd inherit all her money. Have me for your wife. No. No, no. I won't. I couldn't. You are a mouse, not a man. I'm going. No, Hilda, wait. Hilda, don't leave I'm me. leaving you for oh, good. Oh, no, Hilda. Oh, listen, you fool. I'm not satisfied to be just the daughter of a Swedish farmer. I want money. I want to live in a fine house like your wife has built in the center of this lake. I want to be a lady and swell it over people who despise me now because I'm poor. All my life I've dreamed of that, and I'm going to have it, for I have youth and looks and brains. You don't give me what I want, somebody else will. You say I've played with you? Well, I play no longer. You won't see me anymore. Goodbye. No, 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 no. Don't say that. Come back. Hilda, Hilda. Hilda, I can't lose you. I'm mad about you. Hilda. Wait. Well... As, as you say, uh, an accident might happen. Accidents are common. You will marry me if my wife should die. I'll marry you when your wife is dead. Oh, Roger. It's wonderful to be on the lake with you again. It's been so long since we've been in the canoe together. I feel as though we were on a second honeymoon. <coughs> aunt, aren't you enjoying it too, dear? Yes. Yes. Oh, the world has never seemed so lovely as it does tonight. Isn't that distant chanting restful? You haven't complained about it this evening, so it, it must make you feel as I do. It sounds the prayer it really is. A prayer for the dying. Yes. Is that what they're singing? Uh, A death song? Yes. This is Indian summer. The moon of falling leaves. Of dying things. The moon of falling leaves. Of dying things. Dear, why, you... You're frightfully nervous tonight. Uh, Your your hands are shaking as as they work the paddle. No, 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 I'm... I'm... (laughs) I'm all right. You're not. You're so unhappy here. But but soon we'll go back east. We'll only come to the island for a day each year so that I can renew my offering to the spirits of the lake. I, I've taken the Nabag very seriously, you see, for I'm under their protection now, according to Nama and two horses. Oh, dear. Oh, be careful where you guide us. We're close to the sharp rocks the Indians call the spirits talent. They say the road to the villages of the happy dead lead over such rocks as that. Rocks with a knife-like edge on which only the good can keep their footing. The bad fall off into an abyss of eternal torment. Stop talking, that savage rot. Stop, I tell you, it can't fight me. Dear. I'm not afraid of spirits. They can't hurt me. And men will say it was an accident. Roger, you're mad. An accident. That's what they'll say. An accident. You're making for those rocks purposely. An accident. You mean to turn me. Roger, don't. Turn back. Turn back. We're going to strike. Oh! Oh! Roger! Save me! Don't swim away from me! I am sinking! Roger, come back! Oh, God, I pray thee! Oh, spirits of the lake! Punish! 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 <laughs> the 
Garrett of the Lake is gonna punish that fellow. All right. And when next you folks come see me and Satan, we'll tell you exactly how. <laughs> About a very pretty finish to this little bedtime story. <laughs> Bring you The Witch's Tale, written and produced by Alonzo Dean Cole. Now let us join old Nancy and Satan, her wise black cat. <laughs> Hunter and five year old I be today. Yes, sir. Hunter and five year old. Will Satan? Suppose we get right down to business and finish that cheerful little story we begun when last these folks was here. Douse out them lights. Old Nancy's yarn sound best when heard in gloom and shadow. Let's see, Satan. What we leave off? Oh, yes. We told about that married couple who was living on an island in a spirit haunted lake, a tribe of Indians worshipped. The wife, who was an invalid, was pretty friendly with the Indians. And they taught her to make friends with the Neva Norbabes, which is their name for their water spirit. Well, sir, her husband went a northwest and fell in love with a girl named Hilda. And this Hilda gave him the idea of drowning his wife so he'd inherit her money and be free to marry again. And as we left off our story, that's just what this no good fella went and done, making it look as if her death was accidental. Now draw up to the fire and gaze into the embers. Two years has passed since that fella killed his wife, and now he's married to the other woman. Gaze into the embers deep. Soon you'll see him sitting in a stateroom on a railroad train. Soon you'll hear more about the spirits of the lake. <laughs> the spirits of the lake. <laughs> What's the next station? Only 
few miles now. Anyone would think something was going to happen to you on the island, the way you're whining about going back there. Oh, I don't want to go back there, Hilda. If you were anything but a human cake of ice, you'd understand my feelings about the place. What a durable conscience you have. After two long years, the accidental death of your former wife bothers you as much as ever. Hilda, for God's sake, don't talk like that. Oh, don't worry. I hardly think anyone is listening at our stateroom door. You fooled the law for so long, it's not apt to get wise to you now. Oh, won't you ever let me forget? It was all your fault anyway. You planned it. You drove me I had it. nothing to do with it. I wasn't even there. In fact, I know nothing about it. Oh, God. Snap out of this and get our bags together for the porter. If my folks are at the station to meet us, I don't want them to see you looking like a frightened cur. Couldn't we stay with your family while we're here instead of... On the island. Live in a dinky farmhouse when I can swell it over the neighbors in that big house on the island? I guess not. But, Hilda, I, I, I've told you I'd buy you a nicer place somewhere else. Hilda, I'll buy you anything you want, but don't make me go back there. You could there. buy me the most expensive mansion on Park Avenue and wouldn't give me the kick of living on that island. Owning that big house there, swelling it over the people who knew me when I was poor. You kept it from me for two years, but now at last I'm going to have it. You don't understand. Oh, yes, I do. It isn't just conscience that troubles you. You're afraid of the place. Afraid of an Indian superstition. No, I... Lar! Your other wife made you believe there were spirits in that lake. Some sort of Indian goblins who'd make you pay for what you did to her. You said she called upon them as she sank beneath the water. Yeah. With her last breath, she called on them to... I'll go with you, Hilda. Just let's not talk anymore about it. All right. Well, coming in. If my family are waiting here, they can drive us to Two Horses Place and he can row us to the island. Get those bags together. Coming back in the end of summer. What about it? Two years. Oh, quiet. Who's there? Hold him, ma'am. We've come to your station. We're ready. Open the door and help him get the bags. Here. The moon of falling leaves. The time of the day. The house looks simply great, Norma. Never knew it had been vacant for two years the way you've kept it. I've been over every inch, Roger, and it's spotless. This this was worth a raise in wages. You like me for a boss, old woman. Oh. Norma, your people are singing their prayer to the spirits of the lake. Oh. It's from the moon of falling leaves. Yes, I know. I'll have died. Me go now. Oh, run along. Two horses is waiting for you in his rowboat. Mind you bring back everything I'm sending you for, too. Oh, oh Nama, wait a minute. Is the... Is the canoe in good shape if... If we wanted to leave the island... What do you mean, if we want to leave the island? Hilda, I... The canoe, all oh, right. Go on, get out. Me go. Have not you any sense at all? The way you've acted since we landed here, even those stupid Indians know you're scared to death of the place... You want them to suspect the reason why? Oh, I think they've always suspected. Now we're alone here, you and me. Well, what of it? Get out of this kitchen. You better lay down a while and see if you can pull yourself together. I'll try. Where till I put down this window? I, I can't stand that noise of those drums, that chanting. Well, I'm not crazy about it myself. Hmm. Looks like a storm is blowing up. Come into the living room. No, My no, no, living room. No, Hilda. I can't go in Oh, there. I forgot that's where they brought her when they found her in the lake. Yes, they laid her on the divan in there. I had to go in and look at her. Hilda, you think I'm mad to believe there may be spirits in these waters, as the Indians say. Spirits who love Bernice, who would punish those who hurt her. There was something queer about the way they brought her from that lake. What do you mean? It was as though the lake had taken care of her. Taken, taken care of her? Yes. You know the slime that coats its surface in this month of falling leaves? Green, filthy slime that rises from the bottom and covers all it touches. 
Beneath his clothes were sodden. Weeds were entangled in her matted hair. The ugly slime had never touched her. The lake had not defiled the one who loved it. What a booby you are. Your mind is so filled with crazy notions about the place you're only a step above a lunatic. Now that you're here and can see for yourself there's nothing to be afraid of, you may come to your senses. Come on. We're going in that living room. I... Oh, you must be right. There can't be anything to be afraid well, of. Of course there isn't. Come on. Hilda, wait. What's the matter? But I heard a cough. Cough? Yes. <coughs> there it is again. There's someone in that room. Well, now... Who... Wait, wait, wait. Don't open that door. What's the matter with you? You're white as a sheep. Hilda. That's the way she used to cough. You're crazy. It's probably Nama. She's come back in the house no, by no. the other door. Look out the window. Nana's with two horses in the middle of the lake. That's funny. I don't see how anyone else could be in the house. I inspected every room. <coughs> There's the cough again. I'll soon find out who's doing it. Hilda, don't open that door. Oh, get out of my way, you coward. I thought so. The room is empty. There. Empty. There's <coughs> the cough again. It's from the next room. Don't leave me, Hilda. Oh, this room is empty, too. Oh, thank God. Funny that we both should have heard that cough. Oh, you've talked so much you've got me imagining things. Yeah, maybe we imagined it. It's going to rain. You know how damp it's grown suddenly? Very damp. Suddenly. Where did that come from? What? A moment ago, this room was clean as a pin. What do you see? Look there on my rug. A patch of... Eh, it's slime. Green slime. In the bottom of the lake. That squaw didn't clean No, no, it. it wasn't there a moment ago. You just said yourself. Oh, I must have overlooked it. Hilda, look, there's more. That spot wasn't there before. And there's another patch on the divan. Slime. Green slime from the bottom of the lake. Hilda, the spot on the divan is growing larger. It is, spreading. What's causing it? That divan is where they laid her oh, when... Stop that. There's a natural explanation for this. We've got to find ah. it. Patch of slime fell on my hand. From what? I don't know. It's falling all around us. Hilda. Spot on the divan. It's still growing. It's water soaked all over. It's on the day she lay there. Well, she's dead and buried. It's from something else. <coughs> that cough again. She's here, though. We can't see her. Oh, no, I won't believe that. Water's oozing from the walls. And slime. Slime. Green slime. It's coming from the plumbing. Rain from something next. Oh, it's from the lake. The lake is going to punish us. I knew it when if we came back. I, I had nothing to do with it. It was you who killed it her. It was you who made me. Ah! On the couch. A woman's body. Hers. Yes, I saw it when they brought her in. Let me out of here. Let me out. Yes. Run. 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 Get me off this island. This way. Oh, God. But if we leave the land, the lake will get us. It is nothing against me. I didn't do anything. More slime fell on me. It's dripping from the trees. Yes. It's falling all against us. It's falling on both of us. On you as well as me. Slime, ugly slime from the bottom of the, the lake. The canoe, the canoe at last. Shove off. No, not on that lake. That's what it wants, to get me on the water. Wait, don't stand here. I won't go on that lake. Ah! Look behind you. Bernice, the woman that we killed. Shove off. Get away. She's coming toward yes. us. Yes, Her cold, wet arms are reaching out for me. Oh, paddle, paddle. Yes. She's reached the water's edge. For the hair all method, dripping from the lake. The slime that covers us is not defiled her. Get me away. Use all your strength. Paddle. Paddle. Ah, paddle. Slapped in two. Oh. It was eaten two by worms. Worms from the lake. Oh, we're drifting. No, we're going too far. Something is pulling us through the water. Something we can't see. We're going toward the rock. Yes, the spirit's talons. <laughs> the road to death leads over rocks like that, she told me. Only the good can keep their footing on them. The bad fall off into eternal torment. I'm not going to be dashed against them. I'm going to save myself. I'm going to swim. You can't save yourself. She prayed the lake to punish us. It will never let us go. Oh, help! Help! Something's dragging me. Go! Spirits of the lake. The Nibanobe. Help! Help! The rocks. The road to death. Eternal torment. Ah. Cold hands. Pulling me down to the slime at the bottom. <gasps> Bernice, you prayed the lake to punish. <gasps> the slime. 
slime. The slime that spared her will cover me forevermore. <gasps> <laughs> well, Satan, the moral of this story is that crime don't pay, especially if you live around an Indian lake. For if the law don't get you, then the spirits will. Come see me next time I have a birthday, and we'll have another thirty yarn to spin you. <laughs> To what lengths will someone go in order to survive? Does the survival instinct override their conscience and allow them to commit not only murder but also the taboo act of cannibalism? What happens when a person crosses the line from dark fantasy to real-life acts of brutal rape, murder, and cannibalism? Are these people driven by a desire so insatiable that they're incapable of controlling it? Murderous Minds Volume 3 – Stories of Real-Life Murderers That Escape the Headlines is the latest offering in a series that takes you inside the lives of killers who committed cold-blooded murder for a glimpse at events that drove them to kill. Authored within a historical context, each chapter is an unbelievable venture inside the dark and twisted world of real cannibal killers whose names and crimes might not be familiar to you. By weaving a tale in which dark fantasies become reality, this audiobook invites you to see life from a perspective few ever witness, from that of the killer. Along with a historical look at cannibalism through the ages, these stories beg the listener to answer the question, was the murderer committing cannibalism because he was incapable of resisting the urge to kill and consume, or is the explanation simply pure evil? Murderous Minds, Volume 3, written by Ryan Becker and Curtis Giles Vasey, narrated by Weird Darkness host Darren Marlar. Hear a free sample on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. I'm Darren Marlar. Welcome back to Weird Darkness. Have you seen the Monster Channel on the Weird Darkness site? It has horror hosts, B-horror movies, retro television commercials, and a whole lot more absolutely free to watch 24-7, 365. You can find it all on the Monster Channel page at WeirdDarkness.com. Here is a brief but intriguing story that appeared in the South Bend Tribune back on February 24, 1880. Now, unfortunately, this is the only news report I have found about this mystery, but it is still entertaining, short as it is. Here's the article. Lebanon, Ohio is the scene of a great excitement caused by a wonderful phenomenon of showers of ordinary birdshot falling from the ceiling of John W. Lingo's hardware store. 
This strange occurrence was first noticed by parties who retort to the place each evening to spend a few hours in social chat. On the first evening, quite a number of persons were in the store when the bird shot began to fall in different parts of the room, but principally in the midst of the crowd of persons sitting about the stove. As the stove was near a hatchway, it was thought by some that some person or contrivance was in the upper portion of the building which threw or dropped the shot down. Parties were selected and a thorough search made of the building. All the floors were visited and every nook and corner ransacked when the committee returned and reported no spooks found. Then someone suggested that they all go to the front end of the store where the ceiling is perfect and no hatchways to the upper rooms. The shot continued to fall the same way at the back portion of the room. Then it was proposed that all present hold their hands up over their heads in order that no one could use his hands to throw or drop the shot. Still, the shot fell as usual. Many believe the shot is thrown by the spirit of a burglar who was shot and killed in the store in 1874 while attempting to rob it. Will NASA help Scotland search for the Loch Ness Monster? Is it possible that time doesn't really exist? Can you find true love and marriage with a ghost? How can a pothole revive the dead? These are just some of the questions I have in my new YouTube series, Mind of Marlar. It's full of the strange and macabre as you'd expect from my Weird Darkness podcast, but with an added twist of humor, satire, and absurdity. If you like comedy and creepiness, check out Mind of Marlar on YouTube or visit WeirdDarkness.com slash Mind of Marlar. Countdown for blast off. X minus five, four, three, two, X minus one, fire. From the far horizons of the unknown come transcribed tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future, adventures in which you'll live in a million could-be years on a thousand maybe worlds. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Street and Smith, publishers of astounding science fiction, presents... X minus one... Tonight, the Ray Bradbury story entitled, And the Moon Be Still as Bright. The first three expeditions for Mars left Earth in a mushroom of flame, arced through the atmosphere, and finally dwindled to tiny specks in the big eye of the Mount Palomar telescope, and then were lost to sight forever. The prearranged landing signals flashed back to Earth, and then the radios went dead. One after the other, ships had disappeared and were never heard from again. But still, the rockets came. The fourth expedition emerged from the silent gulfs of space, angled down toward the floating red disk of Mars, down into an orbit as the order came to land. The last blast of the bow jets broke red against the blue desert sands and the ship slid to a halt at the edge of a vast city that reflected the icy glare of the moonlight. For a while, all was still. All right, Park Hill. Open the airlock. Hi, sir. Oh, fresh air. Hey, it's cold out here. Who cares? We got here. I thought I'd never hit solid ground again. Hey, how about a fire, Captain Wildy? It's freezing. Later. We have work to do. Oh, smell that air. Why, well, you could get drunk on it. 
Say, there's an idea. Why don't we break out a bottle and celebrate? Biggs, there will be no drinking done till we're secured. But we're landed, Captain. Three other expeditions landed and disappeared within 24 hours. Now, we're not relaxing security till we find out what happened to them. What do you mean? Maybe Martian? Sender, you're an archaeologist. How old would you say they are? I can't tell till I study them more closely. It's a kind of engineering we couldn't duplicate on Earth. Well, I'm not interested in the architecture now. I want to make sure there's nothing there that might be dangerous. Mr. Hathaway. Yes, sir? I want you and Spender to take a reconnaissance party into the city and find out what's there. We'll set up camp here. No man is to go more than 50 feet from this rocket. And there'll be no celebration till Hathaway and his party report back. In the sea bottoms, the wind stirred along faint vapors. And from the mountains, great stone visages looked upon the silvery rocket and the small fire. The sky was black overhead as the two racing moons threw knife-edged double shadows on the desert. All right, come and get it. Ciao. Hey, what do you got to eat, Jackie? Sort of smothered in cold chicken fat. Good, I thought it was something I couldn't eat. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, Captain! Mr. Hathaway's back. Oh, Captain, Captain Wilder. Oh, yes, over here, Mr. Hathaway. Well? Most of the city's dead. Spender says it's been dead a good many thousand years, but we found one part about a mile over Troy. What about it? People were living in it last week, sir. People? Martians. Where are they now? Dead. We found bodies, thousands of bodies. They hadn't been dead more than ten days. What did they die of? You won't believe it. What killed them? Chicken pox. Chicken pox? Yes. Where could they get chicken pox? From Earth. Oh, then the other rockets did get through. Yes. I don't know what the Martians did to them, but I sure know what they did to the Martians. They gave them chicken pox and wiped them out. They just didn't have any resistance to an Earth disease. Now think of it, Captain. A race builds itself for a million years, refines itself, does everything it can to give itself respect and beauty, and then it dies. Of what? It's like saying the Greeks died of mumps or the proud Roman Empire collapsed because of athlete's foot. We didn't even give them a decent excuse for dying. We just gave them chicken pox. Spender, get hold of yourself. You didn't see those bodies, Captain. Yes, I know. It must have been a shock. You need a rest, a little relaxation. The Martians are dead. There's nothing you can do about that now. Hey, you hear that? The Martians are all dead. Come on, let's break out a bottle and hoop it up. How about a case, eh? Oh, good Lord. They have to do that now. Isn't there time later to throw old beer cans into the canals? Bender, you're an idealist. They're not. All they know now is that they're safe. A little shouting won't hurt. You think too much. I was safe on Mars. The first Earth men on Mars. We gotta celebrate. <laughs> Yahoo! Twenty bottles were opened and drunk. The voices got louder. The earth laughs and shouts echoing across the empty Martian sands. Spender listened to the wind over his ears, cool and whispering. He felt the land getting cooler. The stars drew closer, very near. The air smelled clean and new. He looked at the cool ice of the white Martian buildings over there on the empty sea lands. <laughs> Hey, what do we do with these empty bottles? Save them, stupid. There's a two cents deposit. Ah! (laughs) Throw them away. Hey, wait. Wait. How about that building? Two to one on a buck, I can heave one right through that window. You're on. All right, here goes. (laughs) Oh, die. Hey, double or nothing on the next shot. Put that bottle down, Biggs. Who's there, Mr. Spender? Stop smashing those windows. What's the difference? The planet's ours now. I guess I can do anything with it I want. Drop that bottle or I'll knock your teeth out. Yeah? Hey, just watch me. I warned you. Big. Oh, hey, what? Hey, 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 come on, come on. Hey, hey, what's hey, going hey, on hey, here? Spender! Spender! I hit him. He's crazy, Captain. He just walked up and slugged me. All right, Biggs. Spender, you come with me. Now, suppose you explain. What was the idea? 
The noise, a drunken brawl. Friend of the men are tired. This has been a long trip. And you have a different way of seeing things. Oh, I'm seeing things all right. I'm seeing how we'll ruin Mars. We'll rip it up and rip the skin off the way we've already ruined Earth. Is that why you hit Biggs? Yes. I couldn't stand the idea of them watching us make fools of ourselves. Them? The Martians. They're dead. They're all dead. But they know we're here. Doesn't an old thing always know when a new thing comes? We've come a long way to smash their windows and spit in their wine. Well, maybe you're right. But I'm still going to fine you $50 for that fight. Now, come on, Spender. Suck in your chin. We'll go back there and play happy. Now they moved out into the moonlight across the desert. They made their way into the dreaming, dead city. The light of the racing twin moons glinted on the barrel of a pistol the long blade of a machete, the round, gurgling shape of a raised bottle. The wind blew in from the dead sea bottom and brushed through the silvery wire filigree of the towers. Strange music drifted down to the double-shadowed streets, a thin, haunted music that played as it had played through the uncounted years of time. Nobody moved. The moons held and froze them. The wind beat slowly around them. Biggs, I just want to make a little noise. What kind of a celebration is this, anyway? Come on. They built this city thousands of years ago. And now where are they? How did they die? Who cares? They're dead. That's good enough for me. Lord Byron. What? Lord Byron, a 19th century poet. He wrote a poem that fits this city. Might have been written by the last Martian poet. So we'll go no more a-roving, so late into the night. Though the heart be still as loving, though the moon be still as bright. For the sword outwears its sheath, and the soul outwears its breast. And the heart must pause to breathe, and love itself must rest. Though the night was made for loving, and the day returns too soon. Yet we'll go no more a-roving, by the light of the moon. Without a word, the Earthmen stood in the center of the city. It was a clear night. There was not a sound except the music of the wind. At their feet lay a tile court worked into the shapes of ancient animals and images. They stood there, silvered by the double moons beneath the crystal towers of Mars. And then Biggs was sick, and the sour stench of liquor filled the cool air. The men of Earth had come to Mars. And Spender turned and walked away into the city, alone in the moonlight, never once stopping to look back. It was a morning that might have been a Monday, or a Tuesday, or any day on Mars. Biggs was on the canal rim, his feet hung down in the cool water, soaking, while he took the sun in his face. Hey, what are you doing back here, Biggs? Didn't you go out with the search party? Yeah. I come back. I got a blister. Oh, yeah. Yeah. What do you mean? Look. Look, Cherokee, see that? Well, anyway, I had enough searching. Four days hunting for that screwball spender. Didn't find him yet, huh? Oh, good riddance. Oh, my feet. I'm going to soak them in the canal. Uh, if I was wilder, I wouldn't worry about that nut spender. Let him go. He's a cracked pot anyway. Well, he's a little foggy upstairs, I guess. Hey, why don't you take your feet out of that canal, Biggs? I got to make coffee out of that water. Coffee? You call that stuff coffee? I had a motorcycle once that dripped grease that tasted better than... Hey, wait a minute, Biggs. Hey, hey, look over there. Where? By that bush. There's someone there. Hey. It's him. Hey. Hey, Spender. Spender? He's coming over. Why don't he stay lost, that crazy jerk? Hi, Spender. Long time no see. Hello, Cherokee. I've been exploring some ruins. Oh, you and them ruins. You're like a dog in a boneyard. What's the matter? Why don't you say something? Where you been? Up in the hills. What would you say if I told you I found a Martian? 
Oh, yeah? Where? Never mind. Let me ask you a question. How would you feel if you were a Martian and people came to your land and started to tear it up? Well, I know how I'd feel. I've, I've got Cherokee blood in me. My grandfather told me a lot of things about the way they kicked the Indians around in the Oklahoma Territory. If there's any Martian around, I'm all for him. How about you, Biggs? They're dead. They're all dead. It's a good thing, too. Well, I found a Martian. Up in a dead town in the hills. I've been reading their books, and they're easy to understand. And I've learned their language. And then I found this Martian. And I brought him here, now. I don't see no Martian. I'm the last Martian. What did you say? Biggs, I'm going to kill you. Oh, cut it out. What kind of a lousy joke is that? And I don't... I don't. Put that gun away. <laughs> You're kidding, huh? Hey, right, Spender, you... Ah! He's dead. You killed him. You can come with me, Cherokee. You're an Indian. You know how the Martians would feel. You can be with me in this. You killed him. You just... You just killed him. He deserved it. You're crazy. Maybe I am. But you can come with me. Come with you? For what? Go on, get out of here, you crazy murderer. Of all of them, I thought you'd understand. I thought you'd remember what happened to your own people. You get out of here, you crazy murdering... Don't reach for the gun. Spender. Spender. Hathaway, break out the arms locker. Issue pistols, rifles, and grenades. Yes, sir. And you'd better get the Bible out of the navigation chest. We have to bury these two. Uh, Park, you start digging a grave, hmm? How about Spender? We'll have to go up in the hills and find him. Just let me at him with my bare hands, a crazy murdering louse. That's enough, Park. Your man is sick. He must be... Sick my eye, he's... That's a... enough. Now grab a shovel and start digging. Spender saw the thin dust rising in the valley, and he knew the pursuit was beginning. The sun burned farther up the sky, and the blue sand drifted lazily across the sea bottom below. He sat beside a quiet pool 10,000 years old and held a silver book. Through the house played the strange wind music of ancient Mars, and he heard voices whisper in his mind. <laughs> I hear you. I've always heard you. Even down there on Earth. Run, 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 run. No, I won't run. What's the use? Live, live, Earth man. Live, 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 live. Live, what for? To see them tear down your temples and put up hot dog stands? Run, 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 run. Run, 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 run. Ah, run, run, run. They've seen me now. They know I'm up here. Live, 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 live. There's Wilder now. I've got him right in my sights. Kill, 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 Rick Man. Kill, 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 kill. Funny, he hasn't ordered them to use grenades. They could lob one right up here and blow me to bits. Yeah, maybe the captain thinks I'm too nice to be blown to bits. He wants my death to be clean. Just one bullet hole in me, nothing messy. And why? Because he understands me. Kill, 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 kill. The only one in the crew who ever did. Kill, kill, kill. Well, at least I can do the same for him. Just one bullet in his head, a nice clean death. All I have to do is pull the trigger and then... It's no use. I can't do it to him. Spender! Spender! Can you hear me, Spender? I hear you, Captain. What do you want? Talk! Truth! All right. Come on up. Leave your gun down there and keep your hands up. Oh. That's quite a climb. You would mind if I sit down? Huh. How long do you think you can hold out? Until you're all dead. Oh, why didn't you kill all of us this morning when you had the chance? You could have. I know. I got sick. I started killing people, I realized they were just fools and I shouldn't be killing them, but it was too late. So I came up here where I could get angry again. Why did you do it? When I was a kid, my folks took me to visit Mexico City. 
I'll always remember the way my father acted loud and big. And my mother didn't like the people because she thought they didn't wash enough. I can, I can see my mother and my father coming to Mars and acting the same way. Anything that's strange is no good to us. We aren't fit to take over this planet. But to kill two men. How would you feel if a Martian spit on the White House floor? You know, you haven't acted very civilized yourself. Today. I'll kill you all off, Wilder. That'll delay the next rocket five years, and then I'll kill them too. And if I'm lucky, I'll live to be 60. And I'll meet every expedition that lands on Mars. Oh, I'll be very friendly. I'll explain our rocket blew up one day. And then I'll kill them off. And I'll save Mars for half a century. And by then, maybe the Earth people will give up. And yet you're outnumbered. We already have you surrounded. In an hour, you would be dead. I found an underground passage that'll take me back in the hills, Wilder. I'll go back there. And then I'll pick you off one by one. We'll see. Well, it's a nice town you've got here, Spender. It's beautiful. I'd like to live here. You can. Join me. You're not like them. Why go back to them, Captain? I'll, I'll show you what a good life these people had. I'll be... Oh. No, there's too much earth blood in me. I may even agree with you about all this, but that does not change what I must do. You won't stay? No. This is your last chance, Bender. Look, you're sick. Now come along with me quietly. No. no. One, one last thing. If you win, do me a favor. Try to see that they don't tear this planet apart. Right. And if it helps, just think of me as a very crazy fellow who went berserk one summer day. It'd be easier on you that way. Now I'll think that over. So long, Spender. Bye, Captain. Good luck. The men spread out again walking and then running on the hot hillside places where there would be sudden cool grottos that smelled of moss and sudden open blasting places that smelled of sun or stone. The men ran and ducked and ran and squatted in the shadows. I'll blow his brain! Captain Wilder hugged the rock warm by the sun. He gasped, for the air was thin and not meant for running. Spender lay at the top of the hill, and a gap in the rocks showed the white of his shirt against the shadows. Wilder looked at the towers of the little clean Martian village, like sharply carved chess pieces lying in the afternoon. He saw the rocks and the interval between where Spender's chest was revealed. Go on, Spender, get out. You've only got a few seconds to escape. Go on, get out of the caves, come back later. You go now. I've got to win this. I've got to think that I'm right. Pull this trigger. Go now. Get out. I'll get him. A slug in the head. I'll blow his bloody brain. No, Park Hill. Put down that gun. I'll do this myself. Oh, Spender. Why didn't you get out? Why? Why? They buried him in that ancient valley town where the music of the wind played on through the days and the nights. They laid him in an ancient silver sarcophagus with waxes and wines which were 10,000 years old, his hands folded on his chest. The last they saw of him was his peaceful face in the cold silver light of the racing twin moons. The captain found the poem in Spender's pocket and he read it before he shut the marble door. So we'll go no more a-roving So late into the night Though the heart be still as loving And the moon be still as bright Though the night was made for loving And the day returns too soon Yet we'll go no more a-roving By the light of the moon
The next afternoon, Park Hill did some target practice in one of the dead cities, shooting out the crystal windows and blowing the tops off the fragile towers. Captain Wilder caught Park Hill and nearly knocked his teeth out. You have just heard X-1, presented by the National Broadcasting Company in cooperation with Street and Smith, publishers of astounding science fiction. Tonight, by transcription, X-1 has brought you the Ray Bradbury story and The Moon Be Still as Bright, adapted for radio by Ernest Canoy. Featured in the cast were John Larkin, Clark Gordon, Dick Hamilton, Nelson Olmstead, Lawrence Kerr, and Stan Early. Your narrator was Norman Rose. Your announcer, Fred Collins. X-1 was directed by Daniel Sutter and is an NBC Radio Network production. X-1. No matter the time of day or season, sometimes you need to find a way to rid yourself of those ghostly chills that bring raised hairs and goosebumps to your skin. Other times you're looking for those ghostly chills. Either way, it sounds like you need a mug of Weird Dark Roast Coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee has deep notes of cocoa, caramel, and a touch of sinister sweetness that'll send shivers down your taste buds. This is an exclusive coffee that I selected specifically for you, my weirdo family. Weird Dark Roast is not available in stores, coffee houses, mad scientist labs, or even the dark web, but you can find it at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee. Fresh roasted to order so it's as fresh as it can be when it lands on your doorstep and knocks three times. Grab yours now at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee does not actually knock on your door because it doesn't have arms or hands, so if you hear knocks at the door and no one answers when you ask who it is, it's probably paranormal and you should just leave the door shut and locked. Thanks for listening. If you like what you heard, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. If you like the show, please, share it with someone you know who loves old-time radio or the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. All stories used in Weird Darkness, aside from the old-time radio shows, are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find links to the authors, stories, and sources I used in the episode description. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me for this episode of Weird Darkness's Retro Radio.